Hey, Muller Junkies, we have a Christmas slash holiday present for you. Please enjoy this ad-free episode brought to you by our patrons. Muller She Wrote patrons enjoy ad-free episodes every week, as well as our newsletter with my research notes, access to all of our bonus episodes, including the MSW Book Club, an invitation to play in our Fantasy Indictment League, as well as all sorts of great thank you gifts, all for as little as three bucks a month. To become a patron and show your support for MSW and women in podcasting, visit patreon.com slash Muller She Wrote and join the nearly 3,000 MSW patrons today. You'll be glad you did. So to be clear, Mr. Trump has no financial relationships with any Russian oligarchs. That's what he said. That's what I said. That's obviously what our position is. I'm not aware of uh, any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I did not not have communications with the Russians. What do I have to get involved with Putin for? I have nothing to do with Putin. I've never spoken to him. I don't know anything about him other than he will respect me. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. So, it is political. You're a communist. No, Mr. Green. Communism is just a red herring. Like all members of the oldest profession, I'm a capitalist. Hello, and welcome to Muller She Wrote. I'm your host, A.G. With me, as always, is Jaleesa Johnson. Hello. And Jordan Coburn. Hello. Another super slow news week, you guys. Nothing much happened. Um, <laughs> no real news stories. Um so let's see. We, I mean, we only had uh, one Trump Enterprise shutdown for fraud. We only had one plea deal that blew up. Uh, sentencing is delayed till March for Flynn. A report on the extent of Russian social media interference. A Treasury back channel to the Kremlin. Mueller got the stone transcripts. A secret filing on Cohen. BuzzFeed wins a dossier lawsuit. Sanctions relief on Deripaska, a sell-off to VTB Bank, a Mueller win in super-secret subpoena battle, an AG nominee memo that could lead to recusal, Matthew fucking Whitaker ignoring ethics advisors, withdraw from Syria and Afghanistan, Mattis resigned, four versions of a continuing resolution, three Putin cheers, two Mueller indictments, and we almost, no, we did shut down the government. So yeah, not much. Ooh. I'm going to miss the holidays. I like hearing the news like this. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like how I put we almost shut down the government and then, uh, oh, no, we did. <laughs> yeah. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to change that in the script right now. We did. We did. Shut down the government. Congratulations. Uh, I'm not affected. Um, my government job, my agency is funded for two years. Um, we get appropriations every two years. So... That, Yay, that narrows it down you. yeah, to like six or seven different agencies you can guess that I work for. But <laughs> uh, anyway, I uh, am not furloughed. Uh, I do want to let everyone know that if that people who are furloughed, they don't always get a lump sum payment at the end. Um, and they are for either they're furloughed. It's about 380 that are thousands of thousand that are furloughed, 420,000 that have to continue to work and don't get paid. Um, Jeez. And you don't always get that paycheck. At the end, uh, I have a lot of friends in um, federal law enforcement, um, Blue Lives Matter, uh, that uh, basically they said, you, you don't get your money. We'll give you five Fridays off this year. Mm-hmm. Pick your five. They call it comp time. Hmm. That's so, you don't you know, and now there's this Christmas and they don't have that paycheck. And a lot of these guys live paycheck to paycheck. So, yeah, yeah that sucks because public service never gets paid as much as it should, like teaching. Correct. Are, are yeah. these like lower level even or just random departments? Like is it is it teachers in a lot of ways? Like uh, people that get paid on the lower end of, of the government? That It's all levels, yeah. All levels, clerks, okay. Clerks, file clerks. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. GS, GS3s and 2s all the way up to GS. Wow. 15s and then SES, executive yeah. branch. Yeah. yeah. Since, since everyone's obsessed with going through people's Twitter history and finding out the horrible things they've said, I have to come clean. I had a tweet last year and I said, a government shutdown sounds pretty nice. Obviously a joke. All about the Trump administration. <laughs> and then all my friends that work for the government were like, this is horrible. We don't get paid. And I'm like, I'm sorry. It was just a joke. So hey. if you go back and you, uh, and you Kevin Hart me, just Delete that, that tweet, I'm dude. sorry. It's a verb yeah. now, Kevin Hart me. My first joke ever at an open mic was about the government shutdown of, I think, 2012. 
and it was a dumb joke. I'll never repeat it. But like, it's just, yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. I feel mm-hmm. like we've all been there. Yeah, obviously it sucks. It. And I'd yeah. like to say I have not been there. I have <laughs> never uh, wanted a government shutdown. Thank you. Well, yeah. I didn't. I didn't well, no, no. I was I strictly that making I w- a joke about Trump. No, shit. we've always been yeah. where we've made a joke that we wish we didn't make. That's yes. I think right. what you were saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I, and I didn't mean how it came across at all. No, it's you like, were saying obviously I don't want the government to shut down. I'm not an idiot. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were saying, uh, yeah, uh, no Trump for a minute. Exact, that sounds awesome. Exactly. Right. And yeah. I made a weird reference to how shutting down the government was like throwing your Xbox out of the window because it won't work. It was a dumb analogy, yeah. but and they're yeah, like, it's was, not the same. Right, right. Yeah. It wasn't pro shut down for wait, sure. Wait, wait, wait. The government isn't the same as an Xbox? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure, dude? Have you tried turning it on? I'm off? Kevin Harding <laughs> you. I'm Kevin Harding you right now. Yeah. You can't host the Oscars, Jaleesa. I don't know, though. That Kevin Hart tweet was pretty... Those tweets were pretty messed up. Totally. There's this really good thread from this... Um, I feel I like I would was. Kevin Hart, Kevin Hart. Yeah, absolutely. And then he called... And then Nick Cannon comes to his defense, calls out only women for all of their previous tweets. Mm-hmm. He goes, what about Sarah Silverman? Oh, what about Chelsea that. Handler? What about you know that reminded me of Schumer? When Trump brought out the victims of um, of Bill Clinton sexual assaulting and to distract from his own accusations, it's like, really? Are you saying like the lesser of two evils? You're, you're all evil. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. He's Here's the an... women that I didn't rape. Mm-hmm. Right. Here's He's the being... ones you raped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, well, high five. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Nick Cannon was being an opportunist Mm. To use it to be a misogynist. Totally, yeah. Showing us true colors there, which is really sad. That's a bummer. I like Drumline. Yeah, I yeah, love mm. Drumline. Mm. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> government shutdown. Interesting. Anyway, yeah, not much happened this week, guys. So it's going to be a slow show. Uh, we do have some amazing guests, though, uh, today to talk about nothing. Uh, Mimi Roca and Asha Rangappa. Um, very awesome ladies. Jordan is going to cover the Giuliani interview with Stephanopoulos. And Julissa, you're going to be going over the uh, Russian targeting of African Americans on social media during the 2016 election in your racial matto segment. <laughs> I'm going to dive into what the hell happened with Michael Flynn. Maybe. I can't even figure it out. <laughs> we have no corrections from last week, guys. Yay! Wow. Yay. Not a one. I but. think our uh, fact checkers are taking the holidays off. That's <laughs> what it is. It's not that I didn't make any mistakes. It's that nobody was listening. <laughs> okay, guys. Anyway, seriously, if you ever have any corrections or you want to let me know if I accidentally call Loretta Lynch Susan Rice, which I've done from time to time, just, you know, shout out at me at Twitter. We'll, we'll correct it. No problem. Um, let's see. Uh we were, on on the other hand, though, we, we didn't have any corrections, but we were way off base on our guesses about who was involved in that secret Mueller subpoena battle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we mm-hmm. thought it was Trump. Pence were like, ooh, who is it? Totally wrong. It was wishful thinking mostly on our part. I think so. I think that's kind of like my bias uh, showing a mm-hmm. little. And, you know, that's fine. I'm not a we're journalist. Human, yeah. I'm a podcaster. so, <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty open about it. Right. I'm right. not like... Uh, Listen to me, I'm fair and balanced. I, I yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't hide our bias. No, <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty. It's pretty on the table. Yeah. Uh, but for now, you guys, we have a lot of uh, news to get to, so let's kick it off with just the facts. All right, guys. Sunday was Giuliani's interview with Stephanopoulos, and it was a doozy. Jordan's <laughs> going to cover that in hot notes. Oh yeah. It, I, it was a good one. It was. Um, also Sunday, Reuters reported that Turkey says Trump is still working on extraditing Gulen. Gulen is that Turkish cleric guy that Flynn was offered $15 million to kidnap and return to Erdogan, uh, the, the Turkish president. Apparently, during the G20 summit in Argentina, remember this just recently happened, uh, Trump told Erdogan he was working on extraditing Gulen and, quote, other people. Uh, who? Interesting. What other people? Others. Just yeah, it just sounds like something Trump would say accidentally. Yeah, I'm just to on... convince someone that he's doing something, <laughs> or that he's just I'm doing a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, or that he's not just focused on Gulen. Mm. Like uh, I'm working on getting Gulen back to you and other people, others too, both sides. You know, right. it's just something you know to make it sound fair. Yeah, uh, when it totally isn't. Uh, Turkey's been after this guy for a while, blaming him for the coup that happened in Turkey, which, by the way, Michael Flynn at one point applauded. He was for the coup, saying, "Let's get Erdogan out of there." Uh, we'll get more into Flynn later, but we've been saying here that Trump would uh, would continue the effort to deport Gulen back to Turkey, and multiple media reports in the last few months have continued to confirm that. And now we can report he discussed it with the president of Turkey during the G20 summit. So, we there you go. This is terrible. It's really, really, actually, 
horrible. I smile my way through that story, but yeah, no, I mean, like that's just what we do as entertainers. But I do, it's yeah, it's crazy. The gravity still stands out. It's yeah, we've been talking about this since the very first episode. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, episode one, Gulen mm-hmm. was mentioned um, with Flynn when we brought up Flynn because he had that meeting. Uh, with Woolsey, I think, that FBI guy and and, mm-hmm. and Turkey and was like, hey, let's, you know, 15 million. And this is after he was paid $530,000 to lobby on behalf of Turkey. Right. Uh, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that, though. That's an interesting point that uh, Judge Sullivan brought up this week. It feels like Flynn was not this week. I feel like Flynn is old, like so old. Yeah. Because of everything that's happened since Flynn. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, we, we talked about this last week. No, we didn't. Right. <laughs> I haven't covered it at all. It's really messed up that that's how the news is going. Uh, Monday, Flynn, Flynn Associates, Bijan Keon and Akeem Alptekin, they were indicted as part of an ongoing investigation into Turkey's lobbying campaign to pressure the U.S. to expel Gulen. Uh, we actually added Bijan Keon by name to our Fantasy Indictment League back in March, episode 20. Let's listen to that clip. All right, thanks to the Minority Report and the new book, Russian Roulette, I have a ton of people to add this week. Nice. All right, you guys ready? I'm just going to run down. Oh, yeah. I'm going to run it down. VTB Bank, IC Expert, Fertosh, that's a Manafort partner. Mm. Brad Zaxon, that's a Manafort associate. Yevgeny Prigozhin, that's Putin's chef. Nice. Torshin, Priebus. Uh, Oh, wait. No, not Priebus. He's he's the mole. He's the mole. Yeah. Kellyanne Conway. Tara Dahl, she's a diplomatic foreign outreach uh, for the Trump campaign. Scavino, we just went over him. Keith Kellogg, he was a for- foreign policy advisor. Joseph Schmitz, he was a foreign policy advisor. Uh, Marshall Billingsley, transition team, he knows about Flynn's contacts. Mm-hmm. Paul Erickson with the NRA. Maria Butina, the NRA, Torsen's Gal Friday. Oh. Uh, Johnny Yenison, he's with the NRA. Sergey Milian, Veselnitskaya. Roman Benyaminov, he has knowledge of the June meeting. Bijan Kian, he played or he paid Finn uh, Flynn to investigate Gulen. Remember Gulen? Mm-hmm. That was the guy he wanted him to kidnap. Mm-hmm. Give him half a million dollars. Um, John oh, Sab- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, John Zaboskin, he disseminated uh, Hillary Rodden Clinton's emails. That was his job. Uh, Alan Garten, he was a lawyer for the Trump Org, and Alan Weiselberg, he's the CFO of the Trump Org. Deutsche Bank, Cambridge Analytica, Darren Blanton, he's a social media guy for the transition team. John Landos, uh, Ladonisi, he's social media for Trump campaign too. Aaron Nevins, A.A. Ron, <laughs> uh, Florida political ops, he's the guy who got the emails back and forth from Guccifer. Uh, Kushner Companies, uh, and Observer Media. Bayrock Group, that's a Seder and Tafik Arif joint. Uh, Peter Smith, he's a dark web guy associated with the Trump campaign soliciting Russians to get Hillary Clinton emails. KLS Research, uh, that's Peter Smith. Colt Research, that's Darren Blanton's company. Uh, Viz Sense and White Canvas Group, that's Flynn and Io Denisi. Russian American Chamber of Commerce, that's Millions Group. The DMP International, that's Manafort's joint. Sendine, the, that's the host that Trump, ne- Trump Network used to communicate with Alpha Bank. Yeah. They're the hosts. Uh, Bridges LLC, that's the uh, Butina and Erickson uh, shell company. Right to Bear Arms is Torsion and Butina shell company. And ACU, ACU Strategic Partners, that's Copson and Flynn. Those are the guys who wanted to do the Marshall Plan. Wow. That is who I'm adding this week. To. Yeah, so everyone but the crazy. janitor of Trump Tower, basically. <laughs> he was probably a really nice guy. Yeah, yeah. So Bijan Keon and Flynn started a firm called the Flynn Intel Group, or FIG, And they did lobbying work on behalf of Turkey without registering as foreign agents. Like I was just telling you, Jordan, Fig received a total of $530,000 for its work discrediting Gulen in the eyes of the public and U.S. politicians. They were lobbying Mm -hmm. uh, on this. This was a stark 180 from Flynn's previous support of the coup in Turkey, as I spoke uh, spoke of before. But I suppose everyone has a price. (laughs) Uh, $530,000 is what it costs to To flip Flynn. To buy Flynn. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the timing here was interesting since that news came out Sunday. Um, and there, there was news out Sunday about Trump speaking with Erdogan uh, at the G20, like I was just talking about. And uh, this came out Monday. And this is right before Flynn's sentencing, right? The indictment was unsealed the day before Flynn's sentencing hearing, which we'll get to. Uh, but everybody um, wondered if these indictments would help or hurt Flynn during sentencing. On one hand, they show that Flynn helped Mueller nab these two guys. But on the other hand, the indictment clearly spells out Flynn's participation in these crimes. So it's like, 
ooh, you're a real shitty guy <laughs> who helped us catch these other shitty guys by doing really shitty things. Does that help you when I sentence you or does it hurt you when I sentence you? Yeah. Yeah, it's real mobster territory here. It is. And and these indictments name Flynn as a co-conspirator. So we'll cover the points uh, for you in the Fantasy Indictment League when we get to that segment. But Bijan Keon appeared in court Monday. He faces up to 15 years in prison. But Alptekin, his whereabouts are unknown. No one knows where he is, and he, but he faces up to 35 years. It's nice to hear this story come back around and get some results, because like I said, we talked about it in the very first episode, and we haven't heard anything that's been like a consequential update about it, so mm-hmm. this is very satisfying. Yeah, it's been a whole year of just kind of wondering, and now we know for sure. Right. It's one yeah. of those things where you tell your friends, you're like, they're like, well, what's up with the Flynn thing? And it's like, well, he's, know, he's yeah. trying yeah. to, yeah, also that, <laughs> but like... It's crazy shit, man. He's taking fifteen million dollars of extra I saw dude and they're like, What? You tinfoil hat person? And yeah. then today, like days like Boom. that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had I don't I feel like people miss the fact that we had two Mueller indictments this week. We had two. Yeah, like a little footnote. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, by the way, two more indictments. And add them up, which hunt. They're randos, right? I mean, maybe you mentioned the one before, but I forgot about him. It's Bijan Keon. Mm-hmm. I did. Actually, we brought up the meeting in the episode one. I named Bijan Keon in episode 20, which mm. was in March. Right. And now we have in episode 60 the indictments. Um, I did not name uh, Alp Teakin. I don't think he was on that list. Okay. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and say, because fuck. We named him one time in episode 20 that if it's randos, we'll count them. So yeah, yeah. We'll go over that in the fantasy indictment. Like, if you had two randos, you get two points. Ooh. Nice. I did not. I had no randos. <laughs> I think you had one, Jordan, right? I said I it was going to be your week remember. because I gave up my rando and you picked up a rando, I think. Maybe. I feel like I've been so preoccupied with all the Stone and Assange roster. They take up so many spots. Fair they enough. do. Spot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they do. Stonehenge takes up a lot of spaces. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, damn it, why don't we have 10 picks? <laughs> Um, We're going to change the rules on Fantasy Indictment League for us when we get there. So we'll go over that. Oh, cool. For season three, perhaps, maybe? Uh, Yeah, maybe we could wait until season three to to institute... (laughs) Because inst- <laughs> to institute those changes, because this is actually we have two more episodes, this episode and one more episode this year that comes out on New Year's Eve. Then we're going to go to season three, guys. That That's when uh, the Dems take the gavels in the house. Yeah. And we lose every last sane person in the administration. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get to that, too. Oh, my God. This week was just nuts. Uh, also, Monday, though, we learned that the judge in the Flynn case asked for the transcript of the Flynn FBI interview. He did this Monday in response to Flynn's sentencing filing, stating that the FBI tricked him into lying. Remember, Mm -hmm. Uh, the transcript uh, document is called a 302, by the way. We fill these out in the government all the time. It was released, though it was highly redacted, but it showed that Flynn clearly lied and there there was no trickery. Uh, on the part of the agents questioning him, the 302 proves that the FBI agents allowed Flynn to tell them his side about what happened with Kislyak, for example. The agents then tried over and over to indicate they knew he was lying <laughs> and ask him again, uh, uh, hey, buddy, one more time, what were you talking to Kislyak about? Hey, hey, pal, <laughs> wait a minute. What, what, you know, like over and over again. This is in the 302, giving him hints about the intel that they had. But Flynn continued to lie. He not only lied about what he spoke with Kislyak about, but he lied about not telling KT McFarland, for example, who was at Mar-a-Lago, by the way, relaying messages back and forth with Trump. Um, And he did. He did uh, talk to her, but he denied having knowledge of the expulsion of Russian diplomats. Um, Even after the agents reminded him gently that Susan Rice had alerted him to that fact and they had the information. (laughs) So the 302 came out ahead of Flynn's sentencing hearing and it did not do him any favors. Mm -hmm. You know, the Republicans are like, show us the 302. The FBI is corrupt. And they get it and they're like, oops. Mm -hmm. Uh Yeah, I don't want to see that. Never mind. Never mind. Put it away. Not those receipts. (laughs) Burn it. Yeah, It was was bad. Fake paper. (laughs) (laughs) What did you say that one time? The words... And, yeah, <laughs> it's like offensive to the words on the page for the eyes to lay on them or something. Yeah, for your brain to do something. That was really funny. You should get that on a t-shirt, dude. <laughs> it was good, right? Yeah. Don't look at my words. <laughs> Don't look at my words. It's offensive that your eyes are on them. Uh, also, Monday, uh, Monday, Comey is sick of your shit. <laughs> That's what I call this segment. Oh, yeah. Uh, after his second closed door session with Congress, he came out saying, quote, at some point, Someone has to stand up and in the face of fear of Fox News, fear of the base, 
fear of mean tweets, and stand up for the values of this country and not slink away into retirement, but stand up and speak the truth. I find it frustrating to be here answering questions about things that are far less important than the values that this country is built upon. And I could just hear him saying this. The music playing in the background. Right? <laughs> just his tall face. Just uh, <laughs> Tall <that>. face. <laughs> Uh, Then when Fox News asked Comey if he shared any responsibility for the FBI's reputation taking a big hit, he was like, no, dude, the FBI's reputation has taken a big hit because the president of the United States with his acolytes has lied about it constantly. And in the face of those lies, a whole lot of good people who watch your network believe that nonsense. Um, That's a tragedy, he says, uh, that will be undone eventually. But the damage has nothing to do with me, unquote. Uh, basically railing on Fox News. Damn, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's getting more political, huh? Mm -hmm. He doesn't give a fuck, and he's pissed. Yeah. And he's tall. Yeah, he's like 2018 Abe Lincoln. (laughs) Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just just start wearing a top hat. It's just a beardless beardless Abe. Yeah. (laughs) Then Roger Stone will be like, there's only room for one top hat here. (laughs) Now let's go to my swingers party. (laughs) Such a creepy dude. So creepy. Uh, He also said the House Republicans' failure to defend the FBI from Trump's attacks is, quote, to their everlasting shame. (laughs) Their (laughs) silence is shameful. And someday they got to explain to their grandchildren what they did today. Wow. How old timey is that? To your everlasting shame. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's my D. (laughs) So mad and tall. They're going to bring the grandparents and grandkids into this? Yeah. Like, screw the children. The grandkids. What about the grandkids? <laughs> Our kids are dicks, but their kids are awesome. And fuck, you, you're going to have to explain that to them. <laughs> also Monday, uh, a terrifying, I'm like, <laughs> a terrifying report uh, on Russian social media influence was released. Jaleesa is going to cover that for us a bit later. It's actually really, really shocking. Yeah. Uh, what they came up with. Although uh, people who give a shit for being on Facebook Welcome now, because you can be have, have shit for being on Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and pretty much every social media yeah. platform is wrapped up in this. And thing, Instagram so. more than all of them, which yeah. a lot of people try to say is the cool one. Yeah, they're being mm-hmm. hacked, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you're cool. <laughs> yeah, Nasia Ribko is basically able to run a disinformation campaign for a while from her Instagram. Yeah, pretty much. Until she got arrested. Boat ho. And I shouldn't say hacked because they're actually working with them. So it's less of, you know, an assault and more of a cooperation. <laughs> yeah. Fucked up, man. I, I, I'm excited to, to hear what you have to say, but I'm also terrified. <laughs> uh, we also learned that the Russians had targeted Mueller, by the way. According to the Washington Post, Russian disinformation teams turned their focus to Mueller after the election. So, they, you know, at first they were trying to get Trump elected. Then after the election, they went after Mueller. They attacked him for using fake or they attacked him using fake Facebook accounts, fake Twitter accounts. And then, like I said, they infiltrated Instagram. And in fact, Instagram had 187 million comments and likes on fake accounts attacking Mueller far more than any other social media platform. They claimed Mueller was corrupt and that Russian interference was a crackpot conspiracy theory. Uh, Though I suppose it's easy to convince people who believe Clinton murdered Seth Rich or ran a child sex trafficking ring out of the basement of the Alamo. (laughs) There's no basement at the Alamo. Uh, Then Tuesday, three sources familiar with the Mueller probe told the Daily Beast that the special counsel's office is preparing court filings that are expected to detail Trump associates' conversations about sanctions relief and what the Kremlin hoped to get in return for helping Trump win the election. And then law professor and CNN and MSW contributor and former FBI agent Asha Rangappa tweeted that if Trump or anyone in his campaign knew or encouraged or facilitated or participated in the Kremlin's assistance, to get Trump elected, that we were looking at quid pro quo, a.k.a. collusion or conspiracy, aiding and abetting, etc. And joining us to discuss this point is the one and only Asha Rangappa. Asha, welcome back to Mueller, she wrote. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you're here. So you had indicated that this could be uh, huge. Uh, Can you elaborate on, on that? Yeah, you know, we we've been seeing little pieces of the puzzle. And what the critics of the Mueller probe have said is, you know, fine, but where's the collusion? Um, Because there's kind of been no smocking gun, as it were, um, that everything is connected. And, you know, for for people who are actually using deductive reasoning, you're starting to see this emerging picture where on the one hand, there's approaches being made to the Trump campaign, offering assistance, uh, you know, in the election in the form of dirt on Hillary Clinton, Uh, WikiLeaks releasing that dirt at strategic times that helps 
Trump. And then on the other hand, you, you've seen, you know, these little bits and pieces about talk about sanctions or quote unquote adoptions. And the question is, how does this all fit together? And, you know, I think the hypothesis is, was there some kind of explicit or implicit agreement that, you know, you scratch my back and, and uh, you know, I'll, what am I saying? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that the assistance was in exchange for things that would benefit Russia, um, namely, you know, lifting of sanctions um, and, you know, who knows what else. So, you know, if if what Mueller is planning to file actually outlines some of that, even if it's just kind of explicit promises or commitments by the Trump camp um, that they are going to follow through on specific, you know, policies, um, then r- after that, anything where they, you know, were participating in the assistance that they were receiving from Russia would be kind of a slam dunk collusion. Yeah, definitely. And then we, we get all these little clues this week, like the Treasury um, communicating with the Kremlin about Ziff, which is one of the things that the Trump Tower meeting in June was about with that, you know, the adoptions, like you said, which are sanctions. And then, of course, I mean, the that secret subpoena battle going on with the company A from country A or and, and it seems to all sort of kind of the, the picture sort of becomes clearer. Yes. So I also wanted to ask you about another uh, huge story, huge story that dropped uh, Tuesday, another smocking gun. Uh, about the dissolution of the Trump Foundation, because apparently Trump agreed to shut down his charity amid allegations he was using it for his own personal and and political benefit. But the lawsuit is still continuing, isn't it? Yes. As far as I know, um, the attorney general got part of what uh, the state of New York was looking for in filing this lawsuit. Now, let's rewind. This is a civil lawsuit that is looking at a pattern of... uh, misconduct in the Trump Foundation, specifically that the Trump Foundation, okay, so a foundation is collecting charitable funds, and they have fiduciary duties on how they use those funds. They should be used for charitable purposes. They have reporting requirements. They, you know, have uh, nonprofits in New York are, are regulated, you know, quite tightly in terms of having to report and approve how these funds are spent. Um And basically what the attorney general's lawsuit alleged was that there were patterns of self-dealing, of using these charitable funds to just come back into the Trump organization, that there was coordination between the charitable funds in the foundation and the Trump campaign, um, that Trump was using these uh, charitable funds as basically a personal slush fund to pay off, you know, things like his legal fees or buy himself, you know, portraits of himself, um, all of which, by the way, are are not legal. So uh, what the attorney general was looking for were a few different things. One was to ban uh, Trump from serving as any director of a nonprofit for 10 years and for any of the members of the board from serving for one year. And the members of the board are all his kids. Um, Also seeking 2.8 million in restitution. So, you know, um, this is, this is a big deal in and of itself, but the bigger deal is that the attorney general also made referrals to the IRS and the federal election commission for possible violations of federal law on that front. Um, So these could turn into, if they have not already, criminal inquiries, um, which are going to continue, start to also intersect with the Trump campaign and with the Trump organization. So, (laughs) um, you know, it's just, everything is just uh, mushrooming, if if I may use that term, um, (laughs) uh, on the legal front, for Trump. And the fact that he settled, you know, really reveals the, in my opinion, a desire to avoid what would have been a worse outcome for him, uh, which is discovery and potential depositions. So, you know, the, the lawsuit is ongoing. I think they are look, still looking for the restitution. It's not over yet. But, um, you know, Trump is is going to be in big trouble, I believe. Yeah, discovery is bad for him because then the tax returns come out. Um, although I'm, I think we'll probably get them from 
some committee or other uh, run by the Democrats. Well, and then he's also deposed under oath, uh, which then gives him yet another opportunity to commit perjury. You know, so um, <laughs> it's always a trap, exactly, to make him talk. But, you know, this is what's happening is that literally everything he has ever touched is now under investigation, um, you know, could result in you know, civil lawsuits, criminal lawsuits that are, by the way, outside of the Mueller investigation. These are not, you know, they're not connected to Mueller. Um, So he can't control it just by firing Mueller or, you know, what he thought. Um, And I, I just think, what kind of hubris do you have to have to have engaged in this kind of corrupt behavior your whole life and then run for president and not expect it to come to light. I mean, it's just bizarre to me. I don't understand. Now, are you saying that in this settlement, he did agree to not uh, chair or work on any charities uh, in New York? Or is that still part of the ongoing lawsuit? Uh, that I believe that that was part of the initial settlement, that he is barred and uh, that his kids are barred for one year, or at least that—that that is what is on the table for the initial settlement. But then I think there's still restitution being sought. And I mean, think about what that is saying. The state of New York has basically said these people are so dishonest and corrupt, the tr- you know Donald Trump and Trump the Trump family that we cannot trust them to manage charitable donations. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, he is running the country and in charge of our nuclear arsenal. Like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's um, it's pretty astonishing. Yeah, and now Mattis is gone, which frightens me, so. Yes, it should frighten everyone. Yeah, one of the bulwarks that was sort of one of the adults in the room anyway, uh, even though his name was Mad Dog. Uh, he, <laughs> he was one of the uh, more sane ones. Anyway, uh, any, uh, thank you so much, CNN uh, contributor, former FBI agent Asha Rangappa. Have a great holiday. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Uh, then Tuesday, the Flynn sentencing hearing happened, and I'll go over all things Flynn later in the show. And uh, we'll be right back. Just kidding. This is an ad-free episode. This is normally where an ad would go. Hey. Maybe we could put a little Girl from Ipanema music sort of in the background. Yeah, just to kind like of set the ambiance. To give people, because people miss that. Um, mm-hmm. I got actually a lot of people saying, no, don't take away Girl from Ipanema. Really? So maybe, you know, just throw it back there. Yeah, and then we yeah. could finish it up like right now. Yeah, it'll be good. Also Tuesday, <laughs> we got an update on the secret subpoena battle. And it turns out it's not Pence or Trump, as we had guessed last week. We had this whole big conversation uh, with, I think, Virginia Heffernan. And, and we were like, it could be this, it could be that, soft mm-hmm. landing, etc. Nope, it's not an American at all. It's not even a person. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, the coolest thing about the latest news on this secret case is that Mueller won. He won it. Um Somebody appealed his subpoena, and we learned this week that they lost, and Mueller won. He got, he won. So whom, whomever it is must now hand over whatever it is Mueller was asking for. Mm. Uh, and we finally got a hint as to whom the other party is. Per the filing, we learned it's a company owned by Country A. Mm. So I don't know. Who do you guys think it is? Company owned by a country? A yeah. state-owned company. Yeah. I've heard a lot of beans thrown on Rosneft over the week, so I'm going to just go with the majority. <laughs> this is where my head gets all swirly. Audience <laughs> lifeline. Yeah, yeah. It could be a lot of... I mean, it could be Alpha Bank, right? There's some connection there. Well, Alpha Bank is privately owned. Oh, okay. This has to be a state-owned, wow. country-owned. Deutsche Bank? Deutsche Bank is private. Mm-hmm. I like this game. <laughs> it's a fun game, right? And everyone's like, you shouldn't guess. You're a journalist. I'm like, back off. We're, We're not journalists. <laughs> come on. I'm flattered that you think so, but come on. <laughs> I can give you my guess. Okay, so there's a Kremlin-owned entity that is currently buying up all of the Deripaska shares so that he can get sanctions relief. Uh, and yeah, this week we learned that the Treasury announced that it's lifting sanctions on Deripaska's company, Rusal, as long as he divests the majority of his shares. Well, it turns out they're being bought up by a Russian-owned company. Uh, this same company is the one that was funding Trump Tower Moscow, hmm. which is big in the news. And we know uh, with the Cohen charge of lying to the FBI, that's the uh, one charge Mueller was looking into. And it had to do with Trump Tower Moscow, right, which could have netted Trump hundreds of millions of dollars while he was running for president. This company was actually sanctioned, uh, which blocked U.S. companies from doing business with it, but not Trump, apparently. <laughs> uh, this company is VTB Bank. 
And uh, because of its involvement with Trump Tower Moscow, Sater and Cohen, that's my guess. That's where my beans are. I think mm. it's VTB Bank. Of course, this is all speculation. Uh, it could be any state-owned company from any country. A lot of people think that because um, Ahmed was on the case, uh, she's a um, Middle Eastern specialist mm. and she has, speaks she speaks Arabic. A lot of people thought it could be the Qatari Investment Fund, um, mm-hmm. uh, that the one that bailed out Kush. Yeah. You know, and that also took the sale from Rosneft, that 19.5% commission mm-hmm. from Rosneft. Uh, it could be uh, any Saudi or UAE. Some people think it could be uh, China, that China owns a whole floor, uh, the bank, Ongbong Bank, I think. They own a whole floor in, in Trump Tower. Okay. Uh, and they're buying up all the Ivanka patents or whatever. Wow. I can't I can't remember. How soon on this one will we know if do, – do, we, do we know when we will know? Like is it the kind of thing that could, ha- could drag on for a while? Like, Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, I don't know, but I know I know Mueller won. Yeah, which is why I'm wondering: Will they at least announce it now that we know that he's got the upper hand, or will he just? He's probably just gonna... Mueller wants it secret. He doesn't want people right. to know. Even I think now. he's the if one it's... that's keeping it so secret. Yeah, and if it's not already pretty immediately apparent, like individual one has become, <laughs> then it's probably not going to be something that's going to be peddled out in the news a lot. Yeah, once no. it, he, yeah. I don't think he wants people to know. Interesting. He's just leaving us guessing. Yeah, giving those Mueller crumbs <laughs> and trying to make a cookie. Um, anyway, yeah, of course, this is all speculation. Like I said, it could be any state owned company, you guys. Uh, we have a post in our Friends of Justice Facebook group for patrons where you can make your guess. And if your latest answer is correct, uh, when the company is revealed, you'll get 10 points toward Ooh. your Fantasy Indictment League. Uh, this is for patrons only. So sign up if you're not a patron, you want to play Fantasy Indictment League. This is our bonus wild card. Mm-hmm. You'll get uh, 10 fake points that mean nothing. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I dole out fake points that mean nothing. It's uh, like, whose line is it anyway? Right. Fake points. The yeah. points mean nothing. No one wins. <laughs> I decide the winner at the end. It's just up to me, no matter what. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just, it's crazy. That's like, mm, who is it? We don't know. But it's not Pence. It's not Trump. It's not a person. It's not an American. Mm-hmm. It's a company. That's yeah. interesting. Owned by country A. Uh, and we, Ooh. I can, I can safely assume at least that country A means not us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. So... I'd Otherwise, like, they wouldn't designate it, right? They don't blank out U.S., right, out of these situations. No, and we don't have any state-owned We don't. We're companies. not at that level yet. Trump wants us to get there. <laughs> We're, yeah, well, he tries to say he's a capitalist. But Trump country. <laughs> yeah, Trump TV. Oh, no. Freedom Fest. That's, oh, man. <laughs> that's going to be state-owned to watch. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday, we learned that BuzzFeed won its lawsuit over publishing the Steele dossier. A Cypriot businessman named Guberev, Guber. Uh, sued BuzzFeed for defamation because his name was included in the dossier that uh, Steele published, but or BuzzFeed published. But a judge ruled that BuzzFeed was protected by a, quote, fair report privilege, unquote, because the article involved an official proceeding, uh, meaning both Trump and Obama had been briefed on it, and the FBI investigated allegations in the dossier. So it's fair and true to reproduce the dossier because they didn't express any opinions about it. It was just, here it is. Cool. Very cool. Yeah beans yeah not conjecture right no beans is conjecture yeah we it is distinguished certain un- beans un- beans un- <laughs> cooked beans versus uncooked oh, beans, beans. Oh, yeah. raw beans raw beans uh, we have a new thing <laughs> look out america uh, and everywhere else uh Gu- <laughs> guberev is expected to appeal guber he's going to appeal this by the way but we'll keep you up to date so i just thought that was neat that they won that so, yeah it is yeah i wonder how many people are going to try to sue for defamation or something and it's going to be like government's already been investigating Trump it bro already tweeted about <laughs> it it's, it's screwed <laughs> yeah. yeah that's a fair reporting thing mm-hmm. um mm, sorry you were involved mm-hmm. yeah hang yeah. around some nicer friends yeah yeah, yeah. don't be such a dick <laughs> you won't end up in dossiers mm-hmm. <laughs> uh also wednesday a new cohen document was filed under seal in the u.s district court in manhattan which was immediately placed in a vault Whatever the fuck that means. They're like, and put in vault, put in the vault. I was like, what vault? There's know. vaults? Yeah. I think of like in Harry Potter, that little pointy-eared man. Yeah, the bank I'm trying to guy. think of a PC way to refer to a fictional character. Oh, that's yeah, that's, that's how point. 2018 like, how this How do is? I not offend the fictional elf? <laughs> <laughs> At Gringotts, right? Yeah. yeah. That's so sweet of you, <laughs> You're so nice. You're like, mm. The small man with the pointy ears. Yes, but those vaults. The small cis elf. I think little person is how they prefer. <laughs> I'm guessing he's cis. I could be wrong. He could identify as a dwarf. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know. Transgender right. dwarf. Yeah, mm-hmm. he could. Anyway, Gringotts. 
<laughs> it's in the vault, you guys. Cohen's in the vault. Uh, you have to get like a ride in one of those uh, steel carts to get down to it, uh, but it's there. Mm-hmm. Uh, continuing with Wednesday, Wednesday was crazy. Uh, not as crazy as Thursday, but it was pretty crazy. Republicans in the Senate blocked a bill protecting Mueller. Again, this is the third time such a bill has been struck down by Republicans. Yay. <laughs> they seem to think Mueller will just be fine. I also think so, but like I'm also like, why not? Or do they really think he'll be fine? Or the, do they just not want to play a part in making him for sure fine? Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's like, what does it hurt? It hurts them, is what it sounds like. I guess if they can't fire him, they're like, damn it, we can't get rid of him now. But yeah, yeah, it seems like, just do it. It's evil Mm -hmm. logic is where they're coming from. Yeah, well, they're riding this wave hard right now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about to crash. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beans. (laughs) And for this week in What the Fuck, uh, apparently Roger Stone is selling rocks to fund his legal defense. He's literally selling rocks. He calls Roger Stone's. When I said kick rocks, I didn't mean literally. <laughs> For nine dollars. <laughs> wow. Each stone? Yeah. Wow. Roger Stones are nine dollars. That's a little pricey. And he puts his name on it, Roger. I like to see him show up on Shark Tank. <laughs> like, aren't you that guy who uh that's no matter. Aren't you from the Society for Creative Anachronisms? What are you doing here? Uh aren't you a LARPer? Why are you here? <laughs> In other stone <laughs> news, um, he's selling rocks, you guys. That's so crazy. That's crazy. I to, wish we could spend more time on it. To cover his legal fees. Oh, my goodness. That's adorable. It's like a lemonade stand for high crimes. <laughs> the saddest lemonade stand. <laughs> lemonade stand for a creepy old pervert. Yeah. This is the comedic part of the movie where they just kind of break the tension a little bit, you know? Yeah. That one random <laughs> do, do, comedy scene. Do, 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 do. He's out there in his front yard. He's got a bunch of rocks with Roger written on him. Nine dollars. <laughs> Help me defend myself. How did he oh get to nine dollars? What was the cost? And that's crazy. It's the overhead. <laughs> like, well, it took me zero dollars to steal this from a beach. Yeah, just keep them all in your head. You'll be fine. I don't think you guys understand what goes into selling rocks? There's a lot to it. Oh, maybe it's code word for drugs. And also, Ooh. dumbest thing you could ever think to ship to anyone because it's going to be really expensive. It's going to sink the ship. <laughs> sure. I just ship boxes of water. It's very financially prudent. Let's check what's inside the rocks. There might be a message, and we're, we're just missing this. Just crack it open. Illusion in plain sight, man. Yeah. Crack it open. It's like Molly. Oh, what? Yeah. Or like Dear Putin, a little fortune cookie type of situation. Ooh. Unroll it. Hello. <laughs> And then you have to add, instead of in bed, we always add, unless it's raining, <laughs> to your fortune cookie. <sighs> yeah, anyway. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> it, was a good it was a nice comedy relief. I needed that. Uh, in other Stone news, Mueller asked Congress for the transcripts of Stone's testimony. Uh, that's the fact. My conjecture is that this is signaling that Mueller is just about done uh, with the Stone investigation, and now he just needs that last piece to prove he lied to Congress so he can offer him a deal. A lot like the one Cohen and Corsi got, right? Mm -hmm. Lying to the FBI or lying to Congress. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, Mueller has all the evidence and all the testimony he needs, I think. So then he gets uh, congressional transcripts, charges the target with lying to Congress, and then offers him a deal. Um, Then confronts the target during proffer with all the evidence he has. (laughs) Kind of like that uh, FBI Flynn interview. Uh, You sure, bro? Might want to check this out. Slide something across the table right there where you said, never mind. Uh, Stone, though, commented on on uh, this, saying he, he he thinks Mueller doesn't have enough to indict him, which mm. is weird because he said earlier that he was sure Mueller was going to indict him. So lots of folks are also wondering if Mueller will be offering him a deal. But that seems like that seems like his method of operations to me. That seems like his M.O. Whether or not modus operandi, whether or not he takes it, um, or takes the deal is the issue, right? Will Stone take the deal? He could go half Nunberg, mm. full Corsi. Yeah, but... Better- full twisting layout <laughs> and totally refuse to comply right mm-hmm. um but we're not far off from knowing would you guys think he'll he'll cooperate or you think he'll be stone and i mean the guy that sells rocks does not cooperate <laughs> i think any chance he gets to talk he'll take it <laughs> you think so yeah just as just think speak, such a camera whatever horn. will make him some more famous yeah exactly yeah. i think he'll defy he'll i think blow so it up. too he'll blow well, up he's like i mean he's already committed so many crimes at this point he's just gonna be like yeah sure ask me on the record see if i care <laughs> <laughs> just, just say whatever his rock i want <laughs> yeah. and buy a roger stone today <laughs> three easy payments of three dollars <laughs> <laughs> I uh, don't see how this is relevant to your testimony, sir. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. <laughs> Buy my rocks. <laughs> <laughs> we 
We also learned Wednesday that there's another reason for Barr, Bill Barr, to recuse himself. This is the guy Trump appointed to be his uh, attorney general. Uh, He hasn't been confirmed yet. The Wall Street Journal reported um, last summer, uh, Barr wrote a memo to the Department of Justice, which was critical of Mueller's investigation into allegations of collusion. And it also stated his broad belief that a president can't be charged with obstruction of justice because he's above the law. Uh, Snoop Dagg, that's Rod Rosenstein, (laughs) said Thursday that the memo had no impact on the probe. Quote, the memo that you made reference to reflects Mr. Barr's personal opinion. Lots of people offer opinions to the Department of Justice, but they don't influence our own decision making. Mm. Boom. He also said uh, he pointed out that Barr made these comments without having all the relevant facts. He's like, this is his opinion he he made without having any of the relevant facts that we have. Mm-hmm. Sounds like Trump's guy. <clears throat> yeah, the end. <laughs> if you're going to be the AG, guys, you can't have public opinions like this without giving the appearance of, of bias or you know, impropriety, which the Justice Department tries to avoid at all costs, as you heard Asha and I talk about. Even though uh, my name is AG, I would make a terrible AG because I'm (laughs) quite biased. (laughs) My opinions are clearly known, right? Uh, I imagine that Democrats will ask for recusal during the confirmation hearings, but I doubt they'll get one. They'll get recusal because Sessions' recusal is the entire reason he's no longer attorney general. Mm Mm-hmm. He's, he's trying to find somebody who won't recuse from overseeing. the. That's the one thing that Sessions did wrong in Trump's eyes. Yeah. In Trump's eyes. Exactly, yeah. Total racist possum. I was going to say, I have a couple of other concerns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you might, right? like, oh, I have one or two. <laughs> yeah. But Tr- yeah, he was perfect for Trump. Mm-hmm. Got all of his creepy racist <laughs> shit done, you know? <laughs> yeah, in his defense, he was hired for his explicit political views. Mm. That's true. Mm. So... Yeah, it's a little kinda. mixed messaging for that guy. <laughs> like, like, what do you want? Do you want me to be for you publicly and undermine democracy or not? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta pick together. one. <laughs> I just gotta recuse myself. No. <laughs> uh, also, Wednesday, Representative Elijah Cummings sent 51 letters to the Trump administration uh, and cabinet members requesting compliance with document requests. Cummings is the probable incoming chair of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, and it's clear that he has his sights set on investigating all sorts of things, including Trump's response to Hurricane Maria, Mm. the family separation policy at the border, misconduct by top officials and cabinet members, which that could be tens (laughs) or dozens, uh, payments to the Trump org from foreign governments. They're going for the whole thing. Yeah, to name a few. 51 letters. This This request is like a nicety. It's a... He doesn't mm-hmm. have to. He can simply subpoena the documents if he gets no replies. Hmm. But he's like, hey, just, you know, because I'm a nice fella. I'm Elijah Cummings. <laughs> Here's some letters. We need these things. Right. It really helps them long term because, you know, Trump will say, no, I'm not giving you anything. And then they'll be like, hey, we try. We try to talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's basically a due process. Mm-hmm. Remember, like, all the ti- all the ways they tried to serve. Who was it? Kushner. Kushner. Yeah. <laughs> they went to every yeah. residency. <laughs> yeah. Did you ask nicely? <laughs> No. I used to imagine him peeking out of the window. He's like, they're here again. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> no. <sighs> so in related news, we learned that uh, Matthew fucking Whitaker told everyone that ethics advisors inside the Department of Justice had cleared him to oversee the Mueller probe and that he wouldn't have to recuse himself. But the Washington Post and New York Times reported that that actually wasn't the case and that Whitaker actually cleared himself rejecting the recommendations of career DOJ ethics specialists. And joining us today to discuss the implications of that is former federal prosecutor from the Southern District of New York and MSNBC contributor, proud mom, Mimi Roca. Mimi, welcome to Mueller, she wrote. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan. Yeah, we're so glad you're here. We've been wanting to have you on the show for a while. So I'm I'm very I'm honored that you're here today with us. So can you tell us uh, how out of the ordinary it is that uh, Whitaker cleared himself, basically, to oversee the Mueller probe? It, th- there really are no words to describe how um, absurd this is, because there is no such thing as clearing yourself in DOJ world. Um, you know, the, the Department of Justice obviously has um, ethics uh, professionals. And, you know, every U.S. attorney, well, I don't know if every U.S. attorney's office, but in the Southern District of New York, which is a a large U.S. attorney's office, we had a a designated ethics advisor who would consult with people in Washington when needed. And basically, you know, the word of the ethics professionals is like the word of God to to Department of Justice career employees. Um, And, you know, Matthew Whitaker 
has been apparently out of the Department of Justice for a while because he was did some little you know entrepreneurial foray with some crazy company. But he was a U.S. attorney for several years, and now he is the acting attorney general. So you know he he knows the culture, he knows uh, the practice, he knows the sort of respect that the ethics professionals should be given. Um, and it, it's frankly kind of dangerous for him personally and professionally. Um, you know, were some once you you've decided to not take the advice of an ethics uh, professional with the Department of Justice, he, he potentially opens himself up to some kind of disciplinary action. Um, you know, there would have to be certain circumstances, but but by the bar of whatever state he's he's registered in. Um, you know, because there's a certain willfulness now, right? So if he takes some action as a lawyer, as an acting attorney general, that is found to be questionable in, in an ethical sense, the and, and a, a bar association or whoever is responsible for his uh, registration in, I don't know what, like, what state he was registered in, but like in New York, uh, it's called the Office of Court Administration. Every state has a different one. And they would look at the fact that he basically rejected this advice as sort of a willfulness, a showing of willfulness, if you will, as opposed to some kind of innocent mistake, if this comes up down the road. So, I mean, in addition to it just not being the right thing to do for the country, for the Department of Justice, for our justice system, it also is just professionally and personally uh, does not make sense to me. Yeah, no, me neither. But I, it seems like anyone who goes to work for this administration is just just leaves it completely beaten up and battered and their career ruined. So I'm not sure why anyone would want to go into this. And and it's it's worrisome, too, that, you know, with um, the nomination of Bill Barr, and his previous memo to the Justice Department about obstruction, the president being above the law, basically, and now we've got um, the Whitaker, uh, you know, uh, uh, approving himself uh, to oversee the Mueller investigation. Um, and now we've got the Senate. Rep- and Mark Warner even said, we see what you're doing here. There, there there, have to be more than two lawyers in the country who haven't had don't have a conflict of interest with this investigation. And now Senate Republicans have thrice rejected a Mueller protection bill. Do you think the investigation could be under threat? So, I mean, I, I think there's no question that or very little, very little question that Trump's intention is to try and somehow derail the investigation and that his, I mean, it, it's transparent, his, his pick of, you know, now Whitaker and Barr um, for what he believes are their hostility to uh, the investigation. I think with Whitaker, that's a well-placed concern. I mean, the things that he said, albeit in the context of a talking head where people are giving sort of more of a, a, you know, an opinion as opposed to acting within the context, confines and context of the justice system. And actually, let me just make one point on that. That, that is, so the fact that Whitaker said these things on television he, he has a decent argument to say, look, I was acting as a commentator. It's a different environment. That doesn't mean I actually, you know, uh, am, am hostile to this or want to shut it down. Um, and now that I know more or once I know more of the facts and now that I know, you know, even more facts have come out since I said those things, um, I, I think it should go on. But in an excess of caution for the appearance of conflict, I'm going to recuse myself. And in fact, he said in his letter that he's going to leave the day to day operation to Rosenstein. So if all of that is true, then why in the world would you not recuse yourself, which leads you to believe it's not true and that he's not going to leave it to Rosenstein and that he's not OK with the investigation. So that's point one of why sort of it's obvious why Trump picked him. And I'm extremely suspicious and worried about Whitaker. But Whitaker is short lived. I think that the that bar is more complicated. I don't think it's as it's not as clear to me that he will be would be a threat to the investigation because I don't know him personally, but people who I very much know and respect, like for example Chuck Rosenberg, another MSNBC analyst, uh, FBI, you know, former um, uh, official, uh, just someone who's who's sort of 
blood, you know, is in the Department of Justice. He has some faith, I think, in the uh, bar's, um, you know, respect for the institution of the Department of Justice, which is a very strong pull, you know, when you're in it and you're, you're operating in it and you want to do right by it. Um, that is what I think is one of the most wonderful things about working there. And apparently Barr, you know, is that kind of person. He's an institutionalist. And so while he clearly expressed, you know, a negative opinion about the investigation, he did leave room for the fact, well, first of all, it was, it was specific to one area of the investigation. He talked about the issue of whether the president could obstruct justice. His view is this broad executive view, which I disagree with, um, but it is something that legal scholars are debating. I think, so I, I think there's more of a chance that Barr, um, notwithstanding that statement and that view, could be an objective overseer of the investigation, but we won't know that until his confirmation hearing. And, and, and that has to be a really uh, rigorous questioning and getting to the bottom of, of, you know, whether he can do that. And again, that's something we don't have with Whitaker because he was just sort of snuck in there. With Barr, at least we would have this confirmation process. I, I do think that the fact that he reached out, though, and wrote such a long memo, Barr, um, expressing that he didn't like this part of the investigation. It is troubling. I mean, that's, that doesn't happen every day. Yeah, but we may see uh, during the confirmation hearings, like you said, there, I'm sure that 100 percent sure there'll be questions about it. And, you know, he might actually, you know, if he's the institutionalist, he says he is, and he's more about the, you know, even avoiding the appearance, the appearance of uh, impropriety, he, he may actually want to recuse himself from this. I don't know how I don't know what Trump would think of that, since that's the whole reason he fired right. Jeff Sessions in the first place. But it's just it's amazing to me is particularly with Whitaker that, you know, we we have to move forward with it. It's not just whether or not you're actually conflicted. It's giving the appearance of. And that was the whole argument. One of the Republicans' three arguments against uh, this whole um, investigation about Peter Strzok, who was texting personally to to Page. And, they, and, and once that even appearance of impropriety, uh, even though the IG found no bias whatsoever in his work, he left the investigation because of the appearance of it. And here we have just this complete hypocritical 180 with Matthew Whitaker. It's just astounding. Yeah, exactly. And if you recall, I mean, sort of, if we want to go back to, uh, you know, 2016 for a minute, I mean, the whole reason that Comey was overseeing the Clinton email investigation or, and made the pronouncement that he did was because Loretta Lynch wanted to avoid the appearance of impropriety because she had had that meeting on the tarmac with Bill Clinton. And, you know, there probably were very good arguments why she didn't need to do that, but she, in an excess of caution and not, you know, wanting to avoid the appearance of it, she said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to um, be the one to make this final decision. Um, so, yeah, but then we've got Whitaker and Kushner on Marine One hanging out all day. So it's right. it's like what? Right, exactly. I mean, the the double standards about are just ridiculous, in, in this administration in particular. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I you know from I was a federal prosecutor for sixteen years. Um, you know, I, I think everybody that I know from my experience, both in the Southern District and the Department of Justice more broadly the appearance of neutral, objective justice is hugely important. It's not just a side issue. It's part of the job. It's, it's you know, and, and frankly, that's why I get so upset at the attacks on, you know, the FBI and the prosecutors for being, you know, sort of, you know, the, the, Demo the 12 angry Democrats, et cetera, because um, I, I find all that to just be, based on an ignorance of how prosecutors and investigators work and that, yes, they have, they may, I mean, I don't even know the politics of all of them, but people have their own personal political views, but it's they're professional and they're able to do their job putting those aside. Um, I, you know, was very happy as were all of my colleagues. I don't know if happy is quite the word, but we, we were as diligent in pursuing Republicans and Democrats and, you know, people of all different backgrounds, and, and that wasn't the a motivating factor at all. 
Um, and so I think this idea that they can say that about prosecutors, but then it's okay. I mean, again, we're back to the double standard, but, but I guess the point to drive home is that this idea of appearance of justice, that that's a big part of our justice system in this country is people feeling like it is neutral and partial objective. Well, yeah. And, and uh, Comey <clears throat> actually wrote about it in his book, mentioned it, brought it up several times. He called it the reservoir of trust. This whole uh, idea that keeps the Justice Department afloat is its independence uh, and its appearance of absolute, you know, neutrality. That's it's that's kind of the whole idea. And that's, again, why, you know, this whole um, I think the New York FBI field office leaks and the Comey reopening of the investigation into Hillary's emails. Why why Comey will not say anything negative about the FBI because that would put a, a dent in that. And um, and he talks about how long, how many decades it's take to, taken to fill it and how one tiny thing can empty the whole reservoir. He used that uh, multiple times in his book. Yeah, yeah, that's a good analogy. I agree with that. He was very uh, adamant about that. So, all right. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to us about this. It's just absolutely incredible um, that he cleared himself ethically. I work for the government. Uh, you can't do that. Um, yeah, there is no clearing yourself. <laughs> when McCabe's wife was running, he got that cleared through ethics. And, uh, you know, he actually got approval to do that. And, and the IG found no bias. But here we are. I mean, he. People in, depart- in the Department of Justice, you know, that again, that I encountered in my 16 years, live in fear of the ethics professionals. You know, their their word is is like God, and and you, you, if they even say to you, this, yeah, it's a close call. I mean, that was the, that's one other point I wanted to make. Apparently, one of Whitaker's reasons for not taking the ethics opinion was uh or, or seeking an ethics opinion even is that well you know no one's ever, no, no attorney general's ever recused themselves based on appearance cl- conflicts which is a ridiculous statement because no attorney general has been out there in the press uh slamming an investigation and saying you know thinking of ways to shut it down ahead of time i mean it, it, it's it's just a very it's like a judge saying well i'm not going to rule on this case because you know the, the, these facts have never been decided before. I mean, here we are now, and this is the set of facts, and it's an extreme set of facts. Um, and, and the last thing I would say, I think, I think your original question was, you know, is the investigation threatened? I, I think at the end of the day, the, you know, Mueller train, from taking off the name of your podcast, the Mueller train is so far out of the station that it would be really hard for an, even an attorney general acting or otherwise to do um, sort of large damage to 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 what Mueller's already doing to, to the investigation. Well, that seems to be the consensus, too. And not not only that it's so far out of the station, but that Mueller has set up all these fail safes and break glass moments and dead men switches and, you know, uh, giving himself full power of a U.S. attorney and then making all of his uh, prosecutors little mini Mullers, basically giving them full power of U.S. attorneys. It's uh, it's going to be they're going to be hard pressed. I think uh I don't know if it's, you know, Trump picking the only two lawyers who, you know, think the president is above the law to try to come in and run the Justice Department will shield him from any of this. But maybe he just doesn't feel like he has any other like (laughs) maybe he just doesn't understand or he just doesn't think he has any other choice. Yeah. And my guess is he just doesn't understand. So he sees these people who have these views and he says, oh, great, let me pick them and everything will work out. And he just doesn't get it. Right. Or they're good on television. They look great on television. Yeah. <laughs> Seems to be one of his standards. All right. Well, thank you so much. Former prosecutor in the Southern District of New York and MSNBC contributor Mimi Roca. Thank you for being on Mueller She Wrote today. Thanks for having me, Angie. I appreciate it. All right, guys. Thursday was crazy. Um, first of all, news dropped from BuzzFeed saying that uh, Russian agents sought secret U.S. Treasury records on Clinton backers during the 2016 campaign, and that there were back-channel communications between Russia and Treasury officials using Gmail and Hotmail accounts set up by Russian counterparts. Uh, This came to light thanks to whistleblowers who said the Americans were exchanging messages as the 2016 election heated up. Russians were pressing Treasury employees for private financial documents on at least two dozen Trump opponents. Uh, Most notably, uh, Russia was looking for financial records on Dirk, Edward, and Ziff. And if those names sound familiar to you, they should, because they're the investors Russians claimed Clinton took money from, and that was the dirt they were dangling for the June 2016 Trump Tower meeting. <laughs> 
So mm. by calling out Clinton for that alleged crime, they're they're just showing their own collusion, essentially. Yeah, but not even a crime. She just took money yeah, from not these a crime three guys. At all. Yeah. Right, right. I guess they are they're <clears throat> crying that it's a crime, but I I feel like yeah, that's what they do. They always point the finger at her, and then it comes right back to them as an actual crime. So a few weeks before the Trump Tower meeting, Russia was asking for this information, this dirt on wow. Ziff and Clinton. And then that's what they dangled for the Trump Tower meeting. Pre collusion. <laughs> pretty pretty collusion y. Yeah. Collusory. Losery. Yeah. <laughs> Losers. So the Treasury had nothing to say when reached for comment, though a spokesperson said, uh, quote, Treasury does not discuss or comment on confidential communications with foreign governments, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but they have apparently notified the Inspector General uh, of the Treasury. So put some beans on that report. Uh, though much like the FBI New York field office IG report, I don't think it'll come out until after Mueller concludes mm. his investigation. Good point. Like, that's super collusion-y. Like, that's, like, right to the heart of... Yeah, the timeline, the, you know, the, the communications, like, yeah. Yeah, and who in the Treasury was sending these private emails using private Gmail and Hotmail accounts to Russians in a back-channel communication about, you know, Clinton backers yeah and trump opponents who the fuck was this is during obama's term too right that's really weird during the 2016 election Mm -hmm. when all the other collusion was happening yeah i just keep thinking about that like in this context it's like an inside man for russia almost yeah like who who was it and why or did they know like there there just wasn't any information on it yeah i guess they couldn't have known too they might yeah yeah right Mm -hmm. like did they who it seems like you should know Mm, yeah like (laughs) flynn i didn't know (laughs) i didn't know what's happening yeah by my rocks (laughs) also thursday um, video testimony from decades ago was unearthed showing trump having really good knowledge of campaign finance laws ruining his argument that he doesn't know about hush money payments and they're if they're illegal or not and cohen should have known better he's the lawyer not me (laughs) but he's sitting there in this uh deposition saying no i'm very familiar with campaign finance law here's this here's that here's this here's that Mm. ah funny i would put beans on that tape making an appearance in a grand jury um Oh, yeah. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Do Oops. you think he's trying to set up the case for himself that he, he knew as much as he could and still was ignorant <laughs> of the crime? I don't like, know. look, I tried my best. I told you I knew a lot. And then I, oh. <laughs> still, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really smart, but I'm just not that smart. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Like, that'd that? be too easy of a cop out. I yeah. Because so. that's more plausible that. than someone just being like, I know nothing. <laughs> True. You know, that's much. why he's probably doing it that way, though. It's because he's he's trying to appeal to that but logic. But that that's, yeah. that's right now still his stance. I don't know enough about the law. Cohen's the lawyer. He should know. And meanwhile, yeah. this clip is out there. Yeah. I didn't tell him to do anything illegal. No, you actually know. Mm-hmm. And here's the clip of and here's the clip of you saying that you know. Right. So they are claiming ignorance, which isn't going to work out. It sounds like with this evidence. Mm-mm. Yeah, your way would have been smarter, Jordan. If they've just gone with. <laughs> you do know things, and also not everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> uh, also Thursday, the Senate staffer Wolf was sentenced to two months in prison for lying to prosecutors. We talked about this months ago. Jaleesa, do you have that clip? Oh yeah. Uh, And then some big news dropped about a Senate Intel staffer named Wolf, a 31-year veteran. Uh, He was arrested for leaking classified information to the press. Earlier in the week, the Senate voted unanimously to assist the Department of Justice in the investigation by passing a a late-day resolution to hand over any documents they had on Wolf. And we found out that the Department of Justice had been poking around in the New York Times, in a New York Times journalist's phone and emails for the past year to build their case. And that kind of crackdown on leaks actually began under the Obama administration. But the Justice Department under Obama decided it was improper and wrote policy saying it was a violation of the free press. So this Justice Department, this one, Sessions, our racist possum, <laughs> would have had to go around that policy in this case in order to you know, watch her for a year. Mm-hmm. And which Sessions can do if he wants. Kind of like how Rosenstein could circumvent the justice policy saying you can't indict a sitting president. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of speculation saying that this was a political move, but the Senate voted unanimously to cooperate, the full Senate, not yeah, just the committee. Interesting. Fully, 100 to nothing, or 98, if there's people yeah, yeah. missing. <laughs> Where are these two people? Uh, John McCain, I think, is sick. And, oh, no, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. dick. <laughs> um, I, feel, I, feel if the, I feel if this were political, you guys, there would have been a party line vote. Like, I feel like if this were a true intrusion of something terrible or fucked up that the government or AG Sessions was doing, that the Democrats would have voted against it. You would see the split, yeah. They'd have lost, Mm -hmm. but they would have voted against it. Right. Um, But journalists are seething about it, uh, Hmm. calling it a violation of freedom of press. Interesting. Um, Hmm. I need to 
get more information to figure out where I stand. Exactly. Same. Um, well, anyway, he's been sentenced to two months in prison. It was pointed out by the judge that this is different from someone like Vanderswan, who only got 30 days, because Wolf is a Senate staffer, and he's responsible. He's an American. He's responsible for keeping information secret mm-hmm. in the Senate. Uh, yet Flynn could get less time. I'm, I'm really hoping Flynn doesn't get off easy, considering all his other crimes, though none of us know exactly how much he helped Mueller. True. And people keep saying, too, to, on Twitter to us that, like, even though Flynn cooperated and he was the first special fish, that he still should get some sort of jail time. And Jordan, you mentioned this, too, last week, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You guys still feel that way? Like, no matter what, he should well, get... Well, that's what I thought, yeah. I mean, especially when he came out in his sentencing memo and said, I didn't, the FBI made me do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, oh, that's so stupid. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go over that a little bit later in the show, but... That's the dumbest thing you could do. Everyone was saying no jail time. And even and, and Mueller was even saying, including a term of no incarceration. And then he comes out with his bullshit. And then he got cocky. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then his lawyer, I'll tell you in the, I'll tell you. <laughs> his lawyers were funny about it, though. It was really interesting. Uh, then Thursday kind of went off the rails when Trump tweeted that uh, moderate dog Mattis was retiring. And then almost immediately, the Pentagon released General Mattis's resignation letter which came on top of a crazy news day that included Trump unilaterally announcing that he was going to pull troops out of Syria, even though we promised the Kurdish fighters we would stay there. Uh, And Trump's apparent call to pull out of Afghanistan, not to mention a looming government shutdown and a tanking stock market, lowest in a decade. Um, And some people are saying lowest since the 1930s, like since the Great Depression. Really? Or biggest dive, I guess. Okay, because I heard It's the highest still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll never be. It would, yeah, I right. hope not. Not in my lifetime. <laughs> it's still over twenty thousand. Yeah. yeah, it's still up there, but uh, it's lost all of its gains plus some. Um, anyway, I don't know, you guys. Mattis was like the last respected member of Trump's cabinet, and uh, who who most would consider the last adult in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, the special envoy for the global coalition fighting ISIS, Brett McGurk, also submitted his re- resignation Friday due yeah. to his disagreement with the president from his Syrian drawdown. Um, Mattis's resignation letter was a scathing rebuke of Trump's policies um, and his foreign, particularly his foreign policies, not to mention his bending over for our enemies uh, and disregard for our allies. That's pretty much what he said. He's like, I yeah. can't do this, bro. You're being a dick. Mm-hmm. I got to go. Uh, he made clear in his letter that he was not retiring, but he was leaving because Trump's an idiot. Uh, <laughs> everyone in Washington was shocked. Uh, Pelosi said she was shaken. Uh, Mitch McConnell said he was particularly distressed. Lindsey Graham hates this. All of a sudden, Republicans are left wondering if Trump is even doing the right thing anymore. Uh, For even Republicans, which is, you know, it says something pretty gray area. Yeah, (laughs) Um, I want our troops home from Syria. I do. I I think I don't think we should be anywhere. But but not without a plan um, that our allies agree with that wouldn't leave a vacuum in the Middle East for ISIS to, you know, grow. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. An abrupt unilateral drawdown is a gift to Putin. Um, oh, totally. And that's the point of all this is like people were using the argument that, oh, d- don't these liberals want troops home? And, and I agree with you. I, I want them home, too. But there's there's a reason we're there. And, and Putin is the key to that. I mean, just we're there because of people like him, you know, and he's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's, it's a gift to Putin and, and Erdogan. Yeah. And in a lot of these regions, too, it's not even like our troops are engaging in direct combat. Most of the case, they're not. They're training the on the ground forces that want our help. Yeah, they're advisory in advisory roles training the Kurds um, because we promised that we would do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's like I, I myself also am uh, on one hand ignorant of the realities of war because I've never served myself. So I can't sit here and say that like, my opinions are, you know, Mattis informed. But at the same time, we created these situations. Like you said, the vacuum. My older sister's husband is over there right now. And it's like... If they pull out right now, there's that would be so disastrous for their own crusade mm-hmm. for defeating ISIS in the their region. Yeah, yeah, they're surrendering, mm-hmm. and everybody who's died has has done so in vain. We're just mm-hmm. leaving yeah. it, and more people will open. die, many more than I feel like if we were there. Again, with my limited knowledge, also <clears throat> of military, I just I really do feel like I <laughs> I base these on movies in my head, which is probably a really bad source. But anytime we pull out in these movies. <laughs> It's like always bad for the insurgents. It's always bad for the locals. It it seems that way, right? Like I, I really, yeah, haven't served either, but I, I do understand the basic, you know, sense of duty that comes with having an agreement and sticking to it for the sake of honor and people's lives. And, and yeah, and, yeah, and and honoring our word mm-hmm. um, overseas with our allies. Yeah. So you know, all this kowtowing to Russia and China 
in North Korea and then treating our allies this way. Mm -hmm. It's a bad it's a bad scene. And Mattis is pissed about it. Um, And we also learned Friday that Trump's actually really pissed off about Mattis's resignation letter. (laughs) According to a source close to the White House, uh, he doesn't like the way the media is covering it. Um, Words. (laughs) Reading words from a page. So uh, I actually hope I'm piling on here. When I say Trump, no one likes you. Um, <laughs> I'm actually a little scared myself about the Mattis resignation. I feel like he was holding, uh, holding down the fort. Um, my hope is that uh, something major happens with Trump before Mattis leaves in February. Otherwise, I don't know who's going to check this president other than the House Dems. Yeah, and I felt that way about Kelly, too. So maybe I just forgot about Mattis. But do you think he's like the absolute last one now? You feel like that's he's the, the last guy? Because they all were kind of like, you know, when Porter left, they were like, all right, he was a guy that was reason- semi-reasonable. That McMaster, was, mm-hmm. Tillerson, Kelly. So it's Mattis, Mattis, the last of those guys. Yeah, wow. I last of the big dogs. Yeah. I didn't think of it that way until now, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we still have Mark Milley, who's the deputy, mm-hmm. uh, Dex, uh, sec def, but, you know, I don't know too much about him. Um, right, we don't hear too much. I and think. we do have the Joint Chiefs, uh, which are the other generals. But you know, I have I know more than the generals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was talking to my buddy that's over there right now, and he was I was like, "Isn't it crazy? Did you hear the news about Mattis?" And he's like, "I mean, yeah, it is nuts, but nothing surprises me anymore." That's how I feel sometimes too, and and that's why I, th- I think just doing <laughs> this podcast it brings me back to like the the reality of it all back to back just knowing the effects of someone like Mattis leaving because when it's mixed in with all the other news it just sounds like oh just another crappy thing but this is in terms of being the last big dog like you were saying AG that's leaving that's huge Mm -hmm. I mean there's no one else now yeah and also the idea that our troops are over there struck with like a sense of nihilism that's scary too Mm -hmm. just being like I don't fucking know dude the morale everything's chaos Mm -hmm. right now yeah, maybe I'll be deployed to the Mexico border to help out with those toddlers. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Protecting us from those Nicaraguan toddlers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. they they really did steer the, the fear towards that. Meanwhile, they're doing all these backdoor deals and pulling out without telling anyone. It's like they had an agenda that they knew they were going to do and we were distracted. Yeah. But, yeah. And I know they're not Nicaraguan. I know they're Honduran. Oh, it's of just course. Nicaraguan toddler had a better ring to it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you with, you know, <laughs> it's the a comedy choice. Sound. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. We That's understand. Fair. That's fair. <laughs> so thank you guys. <laughs> um, Friday, we learned that Russia has filed formal charges against Bill Browder. Uh, Bill Browder is the guy who got the Global Magnitsky Act in effect, right? He's mm-hmm. the guy who, who brought the Magnitsky Act. Uh, he's Putin's enemy number one, really. Him and McFall and Clinton are like the three big ones. Um, I highly recommend listening to episode two. I could give you some background and be curatorial today, but episode two covers it. It's the Magnitsky Act episode. Bill Browder's testimony is in there to Congress. It's really, it's quite an incredible story. Uh, But it appears Putin will stop at nothing to get Browder. And uh, it's a gentle reminder, not really gentle, of of just how important sanctions are Mm -hmm. to, to Putin. It's the number one thorn in his side, which is why Mueller, sanctions Magnitsky Act is, you know, is sanctions. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's why Mueller's looking into those potential squid pro crows between Trump and Russia about the easing of sanctions. That's like the core of his investigation, Um, aside from obstruction and collusion and aiding and abetting. But yeah, (laughs) other things. Minor details. Um, They've sell your rocks. Sell them today. (laughs) They've uh, put out uh, Interpol red notices on Browder before. And once he was even arrested in Spain, but he was released pretty much immediately when Spain realized who he was and that Putin was just bullshitting. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, Putin doesn't play with his money. So sanctions are pretty much his. It's his money, his lifeline, right? And oh, the crazy things he must do with three hundred billion dollars, man! I can't imagine all the hits. Seriously, all the money he's using to get people killed. I mean, it really does funnel down. I, I'd imagine like that. Yeah, and on top of the sanctions too, I think it also Bill Bratter also represents an instance of a person standing up to him, getting support, and change actually happening that affects him. So just on principle, letting someone resist him totally. Is, yeah, yeah, his number one issue. Yeah. He hates, hates. Uh, We also learned Ruth Bader Ginsburg underwent surgery to remove cancer from her lung Friday. Uh, This is the third time that uh, the Supreme Court justice has been treated for cancer since 1999. She had colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and now lung cancer since 99. It's amazing. Um, they might not have found these malignant growths had she not broken those three ribs. Oh, yeah, yeah that's a great point. Mm-hmm. Uh, this woman is a badass, you guys. Superwoman. Fuck, yeah. The movie about her life opens Christmas Day. We should go see that. <gasps> really? We should I, do a mini sode or something. I almost forgot that was coming out. Yeah, Christmas Day. So Dude. down. Let's go see it. Yeah, yeah. Word. It won't be Christmas Day, but... Right, we'll word. Be, when we get back. Yeah, yeah indeed. 
Uh, also Friday, we learned that the judge in the Maria Butina case. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm calling her Butina. I don't care. <laughs> Some I re- people say booty now. <laughs> Emphasis on booty for some reason. I realize that it's the feminine part of a name like Putin. Mm. Uh, Putina yeah. would be the female. Oh. Uh, but I'll, maybe we'll just call him Poutine. Yeah, that <laughs> makes it fair, I think. Yeah. French fries with gravy. Mm. Poutina. Isn't that what Poutine is? I've heard other yeah. definitions. Cheese, cheese curds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not that kind of poutine. I'm not sorry. not boofing. Calm oh, down. There you go. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, the judge in her case is lifting the gag order at her request. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, the judge reminded the parties in a minute order that they still have to follow rules of the court. But uh, Butina's lawyer said that since she's pleading guilty and there's no trial and no jury, then it shouldn't matter. She shouldn't need a gag order, right? Because she can't influence any juries. So, hey, come on. Hmm. Uh, but the government was like, uh, yeah, but wait a minute. There are some real imminent other charges for other people coming out in this case, imminent, imminent, they use the word, (laughs) uh, charges connected to Butina. And and then there's also all the people that that person uh, could implicate. And all of those jury trials, it's basically the government's coming out saying, uh, we're about to indict Paul Erickson, and he's going to hand us probably like six other dudes in the government. So could you not? Yeah. Right. And what does she need to say? Or leak? I don't know. She just wants to talk about her case. Yeah. Oh, just wants to be heard. Yeah. We've know. all been there. But you remember like her her lawyer was going on TV and doing all these interviews and they're like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. We've got other cases. They put them in timeout. So now it's over. Yeah. But yeah. the judge is like, no, nope, we're going to lift the gag order uh, anyway. So even though the government protested, I think this is like the, one of the first filings that the government's lost in, in the Russia collusion case. This isn't a Mueller filing. Right. Because Mueller isn't handling this case. He's undefeated. Mueller's undefeated. Yeah. Mueller remains undefeated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, the big news Friday was the government shutdown, Woohoo! Uh, which was pretty much orchestrated by Rush Limbaugh and Ann Coulter, uh, because here's what happened, right? Trump seemed to be wavering on the wall, and then Ann Coulter and Rush Limbaugh came out on whatever platforms people listen to them on, and they were like, you pussy, uh, I can't believe you're giving in, uh, we need border security. And Trump heard that and said, yeah, fuck yeah. Wall or, wall or government shutdown. He was back on it. He was, it was just absolutely ridiculous that, that it's like Ann Coulter running the country right now. Um, but a triple amputee veteran has started to go fund me for the wall, uh, which uh, has raised nearly $5 million. Wow. So anyway, Trump tried to say that uh, this is a Democrat shutdown, uh, even after he owned it on TV in, you know, multiple times, that infamous meeting with Pelosi and Schumer mm-hmm. with Weekend at Bernie Pence in the background. <laughs> Um, Trump also tried to modify his language, calling the wall a steel slat barrier. Um, a steel slat barrier is a fucking fence, and we already have one. I told them we already got one. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, like I was saying at the beginning of the show, 380,000 employees will be on furlough. Another 420,000 will work but not get paid, like TSA agents. Your TSA agents protecting your safety during traveling in this holiday season oh, no. are not getting paid. That's not good for anybody. Uh, no. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that at least 40% of these government workers are veterans uh, who live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, they will have no Christmas money now. Um, they don't always get paid back, like I was saying, in money. Sometimes they get comp time instead. So, again, I do not understand how any veteran can support this administration and his jagoff policies. I really can't. Anyway, guys, we'll be right back. Just kidding. It's an ad-free episode. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. So maybe we'll do a little Girl from Ipanema, you know, yeah. just to kind of make it the feeling, you know, happy. You know, everyone can... Now you can't play the song while we sing it or it's just weird. Oh, it'll be fine. A little humming in the background. It's not bad. <laughs> it's a lighter note than our last discussion, too. So I dig that transition. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Hot notes. All right, today Jordan has coverage of the amazing Giuliani interview from Sunday. But first, in her Racial Maddow segment, Jaleesa has a report on social media targeting by Russia in the 2016 election. Jaleesa? So on Monday, the New York Times published an article called Russian 2016 Influence Operation Targeted African Americans on Social Media. And according to a report from the Senate Intelligence Committee, when the Russian government tried to influence our election in 2016, they made, quote, an extraordinary effort to target African-Americans. And they did this through several different platforms. But the overall goal was to try to suppress voter turnout among black Democratic voters. 
And according to this report, the most prolific Internet research agency efforts on Facebook and Instagram specifically targeted black American communities and appear to have been focused on developing black audiences and recruiting black Americans as assets. So they would attempt to do this by creating Gmail accounts with American sounding names. I don't know if they mean black names. <laughs> and then they would recruit and sometimes pay. a Ron. Exactly. Yeah. Jamal. <laughs> 1992 at Gmail. I don't know. Then they would recruit and sometimes pay people to spread their propaganda with an emphasis on African-Americans. The report also says that while, quote, other distinct ethnic and religious groups were the focus of one or two Facebook pages or Instagram accounts, the black community was targeted extensively with dozens. And apparently in some cases, Facebook ads would target users who showed an an interest in Black History, the Black Panther Party, or Malcolm X. And the most popular Russian Instagram account targeting Black people was called Blackstagram and had over 300,000 followers. This is like some digital blackface or something, right? This is this is weird. (laughs) Digital blackface. Yeah, this is so crazy. I feel attacked. So the IRA also created dozens of websites disguised as sites created by other black people. And they had URL names like blackmattersus.com, blacktivist.info, or my personal favorite, (laughs) blacksoul.us. It got soul. And some of them didn't even make any sense. There was one called blacktolive.org. What is black to live? It's like die hard. It makes no sense. It means I'm. we're all dead. <laughs> yeah, it's white genocide is what yeah. that means. But somehow that one actually became their most popular YouTube channel. So, yeah, they really resonated with the black community. So even though the report provides all this info on how the Russians targeted African-Americans, it fails to explain why they did. My conjecture is that they were afraid maybe of how Democratic voters helped elect Barack Obama. Like that probably was a really big fear of theirs from that racist villain perspective, of course. Fear of the black vote dot org. Yeah, that would have been a better one. Hey, AG, you should work. Yeah, you get a better job. (laughs) Work for the Russians. All right. (laughs) Hey, hear that, guys? (laughs) Let's collude. Oh, yeah. Maybe not the best idea. Start selling rocks. It'll be good. Yes, sell some rocks. <laughs> so the New York Black Times. Blackrocks.com. Blackrocks. <laughs> That's amazing. I like it. I like callbacks. So the strategy then, as the New York Times mentioned, um, seems to be how mimicking the Soviet propaganda. I'm sorry. You can, you can get it out, AG. Blackrocks got me too. That one. It's <laughs> pretty That's good. Funny. All right. We're better now. Okay. Yes, yes. Serious news. Now we're journalists. <laughs> <laughs> now we're journaling. <laughs> <laughs> so the New York Times even mentioned how the IRA's tactics seemed to mimic Soviet propaganda from decades ago. The strategy then, as it seems now, was to highlight racism and racial conflict in the U.S. in the hopes of stirring up ethnic turmoil. So even one of the authors uh, of a new knowledge report on the matter, Rene DiResta, said the IRA, quote, leveraged pre-existing legitimate grievances wherever they could. And you guys might remember that as the 2016 election was gearing up, the Black Lives Matter movement was at the center of national attention in the U.S., and naturally the Russian government appears to have taken advantage of that. In fact, they ended up being behind the initial Blue Lives Matter social media post. So, yeah, they were on it. Yeah, yeah. Blue Lives Matter was Russia? Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, of course, people liked it, though, and certain ones took it on. But, yeah, they were on it. Way to go, America. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. God We fell for it. Yeah. Well... I didn't, but... uh. (laughs) You know, it's funny, because I remember seeing these posts, and it didn't resonate with me, but I had no idea that this could be from a different country. They really tapped into, like, the... The The Blue Lives Matter thing is huge. Yeah, and it makes sense on a domestic front. These people, like, they do believe these things, you know? Like, Americans do... Some of them do believe that. Yeah, they basically did their creative work for them. Exactly. Russia did the homework, and then Americans took credit for it. You're unable to be creative. Let us do that for you, and then you can just follow these things blindly. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and it worked. So essentially, the IRA didn't create the racial tensions in America, but they did exploit them. And according to the report, of the 81 Facebook pages created by the IRA, 30 of them targeted African-American audiences and had over 1.2 million followers. And coincidentally, in 2016, the black voter turnout declined for the first time in 20 years. So in response to all of this, the NAACP said they would not use Facebook or Instagram for a week and urged their followers to do the same. I don't know if a week will cut it, though. Yeah. I'm pretty pissed off <laughs> right now. I want to delete my Facebook like as we speak. Yeah, I'm but it's everything. It. It's all social media. Yeah, you're right. Instagram, too. And I do, as a comedian, like I, I use this so much. And it's, it's I'm torn, though, because they're clearly exploiting us. They're exploiting racism and they're exploiting us as victims of it. And it's like... But I think your awareness of it is... 
That's help. the first step. You're right. And yeah, I can but like uh, seriously, like, yeah, to use the platform for better because yes. I don't want to get off the grid. I don't think that's helpful. I just want and to. And when you see those kind of posts, mm-hmm. you can maybe say, hey, maybe everyone consider where this comes from. Good point. You know, very good point. So you encounter it mm-hmm. um, when, when you see it. Yeah. Yeah. Stop scrolling. That should be a campaign. Stop you, scrolling. Yeah, stop yeah. scrolling on mm-hmm. Facebook, and See then you'll, you'll miss something. all of the yeah, you'll miss all of the disinformation campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> Just use it for what you need it for, and that's it. Yeah, stop yeah. scrolling. Hashtag. You're missing out. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Jordan, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, Giuliani <laughs> picked up on his Lube the Truth tour this week with a visit to <laughs> Mr. Stephanopoulos on ABC News last Sunday. So a lot of lubing happened this go-around, okay? First, uh, when confronted with the fact that Cohen was provided very valuable information to the special counsel's office, um, or I should say has provided, sorry, has provided very uh, important information Mm -hmm. regarding all things Russia, Giuliani first played dumb, which is a role Giuliani likes to go real method on a lot (laughs) of the time. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. To which Stephanopoulos was like, all right, well then how about some specific questions? And Giuliani just <laughs> responds with, I have no I have no idea. I know that collusion is not a crime. It was over by the time of the election. It's like, why so skittish, Giuliani? Yeah. Yeah. And what does it mean when you say it was over by the time of the election? What are you talking about exactly? Mm-hmm. Stephanopoulos hadn't even asked him any questions at that <laughs> point. <laughs> <laughs> he just said it. <laughs> he just runs into the grocery store and starts screaming, no collusion. <laughs> yeah. So Stephanopoulos then was able to fit in a specific question, finally, when he asked if Stone had tipped off the president about the impending WikiLeaks that were sure to be damaging to Hillary and the DNC. Giuliani said, no, he didn't. Well, I don't think so. But even if he did, that would not be a crime. That's not like the framework that they answer all their questions and they say, well, no, we did not commit that crime. But even if we did, it's not a crime. Mm-hmm. It goes further, too. It's Hillary's fault at the end. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're right. They're missing the tag. Yeah. The Hillary tag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that they're like, they get to be the, they're trying to say it's not a crime. I just want to hear a judge respond to them and just be like, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Judge. <laughs> See these robes? Yeah. I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> and other things. <laughs> yeah. See this wig? No one told me to wear it anymore, but I'm gonna. <laughs> it's, uh, it's important to note that Trump, in his written answers to Mueller, said that he did not learn anything about such hacks from Stone. So the fact that Trump might be suggesting, or that Giuliani was suggesting that there's a possibility that he maybe did know, I think that could be foreshadowing some perjury charges. So I'm putting some beans on that. Uh, Giuliani then went on to some finger pointing, because you can't lube the truth without fingers, and said, well, Michael Cohen has changed his story four or five times. And Stephanopoulos was like, well, so is the president. And then Giuliani was like, well, the president isn't under oath. Which he's wow. technically not wrong about, which but is he's the frustrating part that he's lying. Yeah. yeah, he's not under oath. He doesn't have to tell the truth to you. Yeah, doesn't that sound bad? I uh, I do wish though that when presidents were sworn in by the, like the swearer or whoever, whatever that person's called, uh, the swearer, <laughs> the swearer, do it. Yeah, they could just slip in like a. By the way, from now on, you are constantly under the oath because you know the Bible's already there. Yeah. Yeah, just do it. Just kill some more birds with that Jesus stone. <laughs> While you got your hand on the Bible, might stones. as well just... I got some Roger stones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can kill some birds with. <laughs> That's great. Uh, it's never going to be not funny. I know. <laughs> oh, you know oh, what I bet? God. Somebody's going to send us a Roger stone now. I mean, we oh, got man. some beans in the mail. We're probably going to end up with some Roger stones. Hey, I'll take it. Yeah. Good luck on the shipping cost. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> uh, Julie, <laughs> Giuliani he, uh, he also tried to defend the president's potential lying by saying the president is trying to do the best he can to remember what happened during a time in which he was the busiest man in the world because treason really fills up a schedule you know? oh yeah it's exhausting yeah it keeps real busy um, also in this interview, when Giuliani was cr- confronted with the revelation that Trump had been pursuing a Trump Tower Moscow deal well into his campaign and effectively said that Trump did not establish intent to complete the project, 
um, CNN, they actually found a letter from October 2015 that demonstrates that intent exactly. It is literally a letter of intent to develop a real estate project in Moscow <laughs> during his presidential <laughs> campaign. <laughs> it couldn't get any more blatant than that. Julian is all, oh. <laughs> yes. Well, they're going to spell it out with crayons. <laughs> I suppose there's that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had to backtrack what he, he did. Said, right? He did. He was forced to I've walk never back. Heard him walk back a comment. Mm-hmm. Before. Mm-hmm. He had to walk it back <laughs> from his earlier interview and concede that the letter did, in fact, exist quite literally. Um, he said, if I said there was no letter of intent, I made a mistake. <laughs> God, freaking idiots. Did you lie, though? Or did you really think there wasn't one? Mm -hmm. Or did you think that no one would find it? Oh, well, he he says, even though he did sign it, there's nothing wrong with signing that. He wasn't president yet. So there we go. Also, Hillary Clinton. Oh, wow. Always. Always. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Even if he did do it, it wasn't illegal. Hillary Clinton. (laughs) Uh, Giuliani then had another moment in an interview. This is outside the Stephanopoulos interview. I just wanted to include this in his Lube the Truth tour segment because it's hilarious to me. Um, I think it deserves honorable mention. He was talking to Chris Wallace and Chris was asking him if Trump would be interviewed by Mueller and Giuliani said, over my dead body. But you know, I could be dead. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Really? And do you know what that made me think of? That made me think of when Giuliani and Trump hired that guy to be in the GSA, Beckler, who ended up dying and then couldn't protect the GSA GSA emails. I feel like he's like, over my dead body. Oh, wait, that one guy did die. (laughs) Yeah, that shit happens. That's like what I immediately thought of. Like, maybe that's what that tag was. Yeah. That I might be dead. He's like, oh, fuck. (laughs) I guess it wouldn't hold then. (laughs) Yeah, it's nuts. So there we go. I was wondering where Giuliani was. He was gone for a few weeks. He was back here. Yeah. Yeah, he came back just amazing to me that trump yeah. keeps him on his team came roaring back yeah mm, it was fantastic thank you for covering that interview mm-hmm. interviews yeah interviews Lube the truth tour we call it that because basically what giuliani does is every once in a while he'll poke his head out of the cave and he'll say something that is a walk back of something the president did for example uh, trump did know about those payments um and then go back into his cave like mm-hmm. he'll just come out pop up say something that's Moonwalk. true yeah. mm-hmm. and then go back in so that when the indictment happens or when the charge happens his base is ready for it so mm-hmm. that's why we call it looping the truth yeah. mm-hmm. you brought in finger blasting the truth that was <laughs> that was new to me um, those are special breaking news <laughs> yeah edition. i just glossed right over that <laughs> like dang <laughs> i know you just went i'm like i really want to laugh really hard but I don't know if I want to draw attention to that. I think of a, like a choo-choo train, like, loop truth, loop that ever crossed your mind. Loop truth. Oh, no. Uh, <clears throat> all right, guys, I'm going to talk about Flynn. Uh, I'm actually kind of tired of him already. Um, he was gone for a year, and now he's back, and I'm sick of him. Uh, we all thought it would be normal. It would just be a regular old court hearing. Uh, he'd be sentenced, right? He'd come in. I figured... Uh, He would just be sentenced and we'd be done with it, right? But that's not what happened at all. Um, First, I should lead into this by telling you a little bit bit about the back and forth sentencing memos from last week, right? We went over this in the last episode, but Mueller filed his uh, sentencing memo saying, you know, uh, stellar cooperation, outstanding, uh, you know, I recommend low end of the guidelines or including no jail time, perhaps a term of no incarceration. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> and then Flynn filed, <clears throat> and he's like, yeah, I'm awesome. I'm badass. Here's all my letters. Here's all my military service. Here's all the people I waterboarded. Uh, I'm awesome. Uh, and also, the FBI made me lie. Um, meh. So there. And then I was like, oh, damn. The night before Mueller's response was due, I had this feeling like, Mueller's going to be pissed. Yeah. I'm pissed. Um, this isn't something that should go unaddressed no mm-hmm. very ungrateful yeah right like it's over just stand there in your uniform with all your medals and shut the fuck up mm-hmm. but he didn't he was like oh and the fbi they were we were jocular and he made me lie um and they named mccabe and struck because they know that those are punching bags yeah for, totally for the, for the right you know for the trump supporters so i was like Mueller's gonna be pissed and he was Mueller filed this seven page scathing Fuck you. He called it a pimp slap. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a court pimp slap. He, he was like, dude, um, 
what? Fuck you. And now uh, I still recommend a sentence on the lower end of the guideline. He took out the verbiage Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, including a term of no incarceration. He took that verbiage out. Uh, Even though that verbiage was not in the conclusion of the first document, it was in the body of it, but it appeared nowhere in the second document, that that language. So then I was like, the sentencing is going to be interesting, particularly with the 302 release, because the judge was like, let's see this FBI interview that you're claiming that they duped you. Mm Mm-hmm. And that came out and it would just look real bad <laughs> for Flynn. And then we got <clears throat> the, the unsealing of a December 12th indictment of Bijan Kion and Alptekin, right? Uh, Flynn mm-hmm. is, is implicated in yeah. that. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> so we're like, he's going to get some jail time is what I figured. It happened on should. Tuesday, right? Mm-hmm. That's what I thought. Um, but uh, I, I, was, I was correct when I said that the judge would also be pissed off. Uh, let me, let's listen to that. Nah, we don't have to listen to the clip from last week. <laughs> Just listen to last week's episode. I basically was... You laid it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, He's going to be pissed. He's probably going to give him some jail time. And that's kind of what happened, um, <clears throat> except for the actual sentencing part. It sounded like it was going that way. when you when, cause It was funny because people were in the courtroom like you can't have recorders in there or cameras. So people are like shouting out what's happening or like (laughs) tweeting, texting it out to their buddies who's reading it on the air as it happened. Yeah. They're like, judge is pissed off. Uh Uh-oh, looks like he's going to get some time, you know. Mm. So basically it started off with the judge saying, hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I only have unredacted knowledge of this case. So, you know, all those uh, Flynn sentencing filings and sentencing memos we saw that were heavily redacted and all the addendums that were fully redacted, Mm -hmm. he's only seen the unredacted shit. So he's like, if I say anything, I'm not supposed to. Don't be shy. Stand up and say, hey, shush. (laughs) Don't say that. Right. Which is weird, but he's like... Yeah, it sounds like a poor system. Yeah. Yeah, He doesn't want the responsibility of having to know what's what. He doesn't want to look at the redacted document and the unredacted document and figure out what he can and can't say. Mm -hmm. Can't talk about. He's a judge. He can do that, I guess. Yeah, Yeah, he can. It's his fucking court, right? He's like, I'm the judge. I'll be the judge of that. (laughs) (laughs) Jordan would say. So he's like, I only have unredacted knowledge. Please make sure to call me out if I say anything I'm not supposed to. He then spent a great deal of time making sure that Flynn didn't want to withdraw his plea and plead not guilty based on his assertion uh, in his sentencing memo that the FBI had somehow tricked him. He's like, are you pleading guilty? Yes. Because you're guilty? Yes. Do you think you aren't guilty? No. (laughs) Are you sure? Yes. We have to be clear on this. Yes. Did the FBI trick you? No. Did you lie to the FBI? Yes. Do you take responsibility? Yes. Are you sure you don't want to withdraw your plea like a bitch? And I'm sorry, I shouldn't say. That. No, bitch is a neutral term. We established that like episode right, cool. 10. <laughs> like a bitch and, you know, withdraw your plea because you you t- said this whole thing. Yeah. And his lawyer's like, no, 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 it's cool. Uh, that was us, Your Honor. That wasn't Flynn. Oh, that was us. I was wondering about that. Yeah, if it was Flynn or his lawyers and they're taking the fall for that, I the guess. The lawyers, yeah, his lawyers took the fall for it. Um, then he talked about Flynn being an unregistered foreign agent. He was yelling at Flynn. It's like, you betrayed your country. You betrayed this flag. He pointed at the flag behind him. <laughs> He's like, uh, you sold out your country. Because he said that, and he ac- the judge actually said, you were an unregistered foreign agent while you were serving as national uh, security advisor. And, uh, and then he asked multiple times about treason. Hmm. If Flynn had been, even they thought about charging Flynn with treason. <clears throat> and then and, and, and the Mueller team's all, um, <clears throat> I don't want to misspeak here, but um, no. Like, <laughs> it was a really weird exchange. As um, if they had another answer in mind and they were being very careful about r- Yeah, I don't know. But basically what happened then is that there, a, a recess was, the, the judge was mad. He's like, do you want me to sentence you today? You really want me to sentence you today? And he asked him six times. Wow. Are you sure you want me to sentence you today? Damn. And and he's like, yeah, it's fine. Let's go. And then finally he he got the hint. He's like, oh no, maybe we should wait. Yeah. So the judge takes a recess. Then they come back, and the judge is like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I misspoke. He had a snicker <laughs> about Flynn being an agent while he was serving as national national security advisor. Uh, he clearly stopped doing that uh, in November 2016, uh, and he clarified that he was asking whether or not treason had been considered. He wasn't inferring Flynn should be charged with treason. And then he asked 
um, over and over again. If Flynn was sure he wanted to be sentenced that day again and finally, you know, took the hint and said, maybe we'll take that continuance. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> so sentencing was delayed with an update from both sides due March 13th. Damn. Um, the judge indicated basically he was giving Flynn more time to cooperate as much as you possibly can. Show me why I should give you no time. Basically, lest he, he would face jail time, despite Mueller recommending, like I said, the low end of the guideline. Now, that's what happened, but I have some conjecture. Mm. So remember at the beginning of the proceeding when the judge is like, hey, dude, I only have unredacted shit, so please let me know if I talk out of turn, right? right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think when he accused Flynn of lobbying on behalf of Turkey while he was national security advisor was not a mistake. I think that that's actually true, and it's part of the redactions. Oh. We know that after the inauguration... The FBI received a box full of stuff on Gulen and were asked to go through it to find improprieties. But the FBI had already done this under Obama with the exact same box of shit. So they're like, no. Uh, so maybe it was an error or maybe the judge knows something we don't know. Um, which could also explain his questions about why Flynn wasn't charged with treason. Yeah, as if he's like, can we hurry this up to the good stuff? <laughs> and I only you're going to tell me that we have to you know, be at war in order for it to be treason. But that's not actually what the Constitution says. It says, quote, treason against the United States shall consist in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court, unquote. Wow. Now, I'm no constitutional scholar, but I know what the word or means. <laughs> Uh, or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Well, there you go. And in this context, adhering means believing and following the practices of. So by that definition, anyone who believes in and follows the practices of an enemy of the United States by giving them aid and comfort can be accused of treason. On they're, any level, it sounds like. That's what it sounds yeah. like to me. Of course, I am, again, not a constitutional scholar, not a constitutional lawyer. I am a comedian. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm good at public health. Um, it could be considered an impossible case to prove, though, uh, treason, since Mueller is really focused on justice and bringing cases he can win. He Perhaps he's just sticking to the obvious shit. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. But it's important to remember that Judge Sullivan has seen a lot of shit we haven't seen and that he would ask about treason is really telling. Yeah. Hmm. I'm kind of hoping that it's the him knowing more. And letting it slip out. Yeah, because the lawyers aren't going to go, hey, buddy, that's redacted. You're not supposed to say that. They're not going to say that in open court. They're going to say, let's take a break. Yeah. And then they're going to go talk to him and be like, oh. And then he comes out and he's like, oh, I misspoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm like, mm, did you? When will we find that out? Again, is it one of those open-ended things that we don't know? Once the case is done, those, those March, documents March, will probably yeah. be redacted. Okay. Well, oh. March is just an update that's due. Oh. Yeah, or, yeah this is the next time we'll get more information, I guess. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so right now, Flynn's just sitting around like, how can I help? What can I do? Yeah. <laughs> how can I put off going to jail for as long as I can, too? Yeah. 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 Flynn's not selling For dogs. starters, you cannot accuse the FBI of suborning <laughs> your own criminality. Oh, God. I can't believe Does you Does suborning work in that sentence? It sounds like it should. I know suborning perjury we know works, but I just love that word now that I learned a new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? You're just going to apply it wherever you can. I'm just going to use it, yeah. <laughs> suborning pizza? Can we suborn pizza? Ooh, I would like to suborn suborn, pizza pizza. Suborning weaver. <laughs> <laughs> suborning weaver. I'm sorry. Why is that so funny to me? I have no idea. <laughs> Comedy's weird sometimes. <laughs> it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's weird. Uh, the White House response to Flynn was interesting. Uh, the Washington Post published a story saying, quote, the White House has lost its narrative on Michael Flynn, so it made up some stuff about James Comey instead. <laughs> Unquote. <laughs> That's the headline in the Washington Post. Wow. The White House was hoping that the judge would yell at Mueller's team for the FBI being shady, but the opposite happened, so Sarah Sanders didn't really have a response prepared for that. So instead, she changed the subject to Comey and butchered what Comey said. Uh, quote, what we do know is... If that Comey broke FBI standard protocol, and we know that because Comey told us that, and he said that the very reason they did was because the Trump administration, and they thought they could get away with it, unquote. What? I don't, I can't follow what she's saying. Nonsense, yeah. Uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. I, I should um, mention again, though, that I think that, that you know, his sentencing, when he was in there and the judge is like, are you sure you want to be sentenced today? Are you sure? I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that that 302 came out and that that Bijan Keon indictment came out. Yeah. I don't think it helped Flynn at all. Right. I think it showed the judge like, <clears throat> dude, you're fucked up. Absolutely. Real case here. Oh, and another thing, <clears throat> the judge actually, um, after the whole case was like 
the dust settled and everyone's like, okay, we have till March. Uh, the judge is like, oh, by the way, you need to hand over your passport and you can't go outside of 50 miles of Washington, D.C. He put travel restric- restrictions on Flynn. Good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I was like, ooh, snap. Yeah. Canceled his trip to Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just the fact that he's seen the unredacted shit and he's asking about treason mm-hmm. and he sees that implication in the Bijan Kion um, Altican indictments mm-hmm. and he's like you're a piece of shit yeah he knows everything yeah. and and so I don't know that that was a mistake I mean that's total beans that's super space beans right. interesting beans though yeah I'm not sure it was a mistake mm-hmm. he's not allowed to eat turkey at Christmas that's how bad it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah did yeah did he walk back those comments or did he actually reveal redacted shit I don't know I don't know but we'll yeah. be right back just kidding it's an ad free episode dude it gets me every time are you guys ready for the fantasy indictment league yes <laughs> All right, everyone, give yourself one point if you had Bijan Kian. Congratulations for naming him. If you had a rando, he counts for a rando. It's a one point. Even though we named him specifically back in March, I'll let a rando go. He's, <laughs> I don't think a lot of people know who Bijan Kian is. <laughs> if you had two randos, you get two points because two dudes were indicted. Alptekin is another one. Uh, and we never named that dude, so he's a total rando. Um, I did not have any randos, so I got nothing. I took mine uh, off this week, man. I got nothing in like it. So this week I'm going to go with uh, Ivanka, Stone, Junior, Assange, and Rando. And my wild card pick for the secret subpoena battle is now VTB. Ooh. What about you guys? Okay. We get a wild card or is it, is it just you? Can we? Can everyone we... everyone gets to guess on the. Oh, that's just like a separate guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with Rosneft for that one. And then I'm going to do Ivanka, Kush, Junior, um... I'm going to do two randos. I'm feeling frisky, guys. Yeah. <laughs> frisky. Actually, hmm. You know, no, 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 no. With that imminent thing in the Boutina gag order thing, I'm actually going to take... I'm going to take Ivanka out and put... No, I'm going to take my rando out and I'm going to put Erickson. Paul okay. Erickson. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, plea agreement. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Paul Erickson plea agreement. Follow his girlfriend. Now we're playing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now we're playing. Yeah. And who? And you said uh, Rosneft? I did, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's the big oil giant that was sold off in pieces that people say Trump might have mm-hmm. gotten. Suspect, yeah. Uh, 19.5% of which went through QIA. But you're going to say Rosneft and not Glencore. Well, what's the difference with Glencore there? Is that more a direct line or... Just another another way to say it. Way or? to process the payment. Oh, okay. Yeah, Rosneft I, I'm more familiar with. So I'm just Stick with Rosneft? Yeah, right. yeah. Rosneft is confirmed state-owned? Yes. Cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to do Corsi plea agreement. I'm holding out for it. <laughs> or I shouldn't say plea agreement. Um, well, I know that he challenged it, and it's going to be a long time until we find out what happened with that. I'll hold it off till more news comes out for that. Let's do Unless Stone. Unless Maya Wiley talks to him. Yeah. <laughs> Talks him off a ledge. Oh, like, yeah. Like she did Nunberg. She yeah. gave us a shout out or a yeah, shout back she did. out. She's yeah. like, Sam's fine. I was like, great. Can you talk Corsi off the ledge now? <laughs> oh, that's so good. I love her. <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, he needs to go on a media tour and get his some fucking good yeah. advice in his head. Get all drunk, right. do some coke, go on all the shows. Rocks for mercy. Get Someone some clarity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get some clarity. Some Hit drunk rock bottom, media clarity. Yeah. Rock bottom. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Rock. Oh, man. Rock bottom. A new right. line of stones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do fake commercials sometimes? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Um, you hit rock bottom by a Roger Stone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm doing um, Stone, Assange, Erickson, plea deal. That makes sense. To I don't me. see, yeah, yeah, I don't see why Butina slash Butina <laughs> would do a plea deal and he would not also see that. That's probably a good idea. Um, and I'm going to do Ivanka and DTJ. All nice. right. Yeah. Cool. You guys ready for sabotage? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, The president apparently has been yelling at Whitaker over the Cohen case, saying that prosecutors under Whitaker's oversight filed charges that made him look bad. Um, We're talking about the implications of Trump 
being a fucking felon in the hush money catch and kill campaign finance charges, basically. Mm -hmm. He's like, he's yelling at Whitaker. He's having discussions at all with the AG is incredible obstruction. It's like, what? In plain sight, yeah. Like, do you remember when uh, Loretta Lynch and Clinton had a chat? And yeah, everybody lost their mind because uh, the the Hillary investigation. Oh. And Clinton was talking to Loretta Lynch, who who was the attorney general. Okay, okay. And so, yeah, all the Republicans are like, the, you know, crying foul, like hair on fire. Fuck, oh, oh, you can't do that. Oh, even though it was Bill and not Hillary, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, and now uh, the president of the United States is talking to the AG overseeing the case who is investigating him and he's yelling at him and his base is like oh yeah all good that's totally fine saying i can't believe you did this mm-hmm. you're my ag i can't believe you let them do, you know, run these indictments and made they made me look bad yeah what amazing how quickly he went from not even knowing the guy to holding him <laughs> accountable for acting in ways he predicted he would i don't know yeah. he's a good guy i don't know him. he's a good guy there's apparently a second discussion Trump had with Whitaker, pissed off about Mueller indicting Cohen for lying about the Trump Tower in Moscow, right? So Trump is pissed that Whitaker's allowing these charges to move forward, that we've heard that Whitaker really hasn't had anything to do with that. Uh, and he was really just notified by Snoop Dagg and Mueller that they were going forward with the Cohen charges. He was just kind of like a courtesy, like, <laughs> we're doing this. Heads up, yeah. Yeah. Um, he hasn't even been briefed on, on the Mueller investigation yet. Wow. Except for now, like we were talking about in the interview, now he's got... He's cleared himself through the ethics <laughs> department um, and said, no, uh, you know, he, the ethics people at the DOJ were like, you should recuse yourself. And he's like, I don't like what you're saying. So uh, I need a second opinion. And then he mm-hmm. put together a group of his own people who said, uh, yeah, I guess you don't have to. And then he came out and said, I've been cleared by the ethics advisor. Of course. Yeah. Uh, which is just insane uh, to me. So. <clears throat> he but he hadn't been briefed up to that point. He was waiting for that. Now he'll probably get a brief on the Mueller probe, uh, and he'll, I'm sure he'll tell Trump all about it. Um, I think Cohen could be charged again, though. Don't forget, something mm. was filed on him this week in the vault, uh, <laughs> put in the vault in New York. <laughs> I didn't realize there was a vault. What vault? Um, though I don't think he'll face any charges like yet, like soon. Like maybe it'll, it'll take a while. So um, I don't think this will affect my picks, my Christmas picks. Same. Yeah. Same? You gonna mm-hmm. stick with yours? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, you guys, it's time for Q&A. Mail time. Mail time. The mail's here. Come on. Bye, guys. All right, guys. At uh, JCSC asked, what are the chances Trump refuses to leave after impeachment? Um, assuming he's impeached, and he, you don't have to leave until you're convicted by the Senate. So I'm assuming you're including... Uh, Senate conviction. So like if he's impeached and the Senate votes 60, 67 votes to remove him, we, we would need the Romney 20 at that point. The mm-hmm. White Horse prophecy would have to come true. Yeah. yeah. And carry him out. <laughs> <laughs> Google that. And uh, so I don't see that that happening yet. Um, but but, I, but I, again, I don't have the unredacted shit, right? Yeah. And if it did happen, what, what do you think? No, he has to leave. There's. You, I don't think he would barricade himself in <laughs> well what if he was facing becomes a tree hugger yeah i mean this is uncharted territory this guy it, it sound, sounds a little fairy ish but it's like actually possible reality that he could face charges the moment he steps out the white house right that's why i think he would resign it's smarter for him to resign because he can get a pardon smarter isn't really his thing now <laughs> well you're they're not asking me if he would leave if he would resign they're asking oh. me if he's impeached and then convicted would he bar like chain himself to the yeah refuse death? to leave right. and i'm i'm no. thinking like there's... a squatter on the american <laughs> yeah. public <laughs> i feel like he's that way already yeah I mean, squatter yeah yeah what would he do i mean would he just walk out you think he'd have to he'd be escorted out <laughs> just, secret service would remove him physically yeah trump what would what crazy. would be in trump's pack up box i'd love to see that <laughs> what's in his Aww. jam bag <laughs> <laughs> you never know when you might have to jam yeah <laughs> i brought Twinkies. some literal jam <laughs> he's gotta have a plan though he's gotta be thinking i'm not going to jail for this i'm 72 jam. years old like he i would think he, he Worst case scenario or craziest case scenario is he would flee and just have that flight ready as soon as he gets off the White House lawn. <laughs> just yeah. like some epic right. action movie. Yeah, but I, yeah, you're right. He wouldn't barricade because that's, that's super stupid. But yeah, I think he would at least try to 
evade his jail time. I think he would flee. He could flee to Russia yeah, pretty yeah. easily. Um, if they I, have him, they might be pissed. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think um, by the time impeachment would even come close to being conceivable in the Senate, it's already going to be re-election by that point, and he's just not going to get re-elected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think yeah, I, I, yeah, the question isn't really about whether I think you'll be impeached or not. Yeah. Um, I think it's something that people should consider. and um, In a fantasy land, then, if it about. happened tomorrow, you're saying, yeah. what would happen? Yeah, would he would he stay? Would he leave? In a year from now, I mean, that reality will be that much closer, so I wonder. Yep. Um, at Apostate1123 wants to know, if we did a secret Santa with the following people, what would you give them? Roger Stone? <laughs> Rocks. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I now know <laughs> Exactly. What uh, Papadopoulos. Um, he gets biscuits because there's a Papadopoulos biscuits company out there. Oh, oh yeah. Someone that's tweeted really nice us. of you. Oh, is it? Okay, then he doesn't get biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> Humility. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, okay. Um, a hairline. No, he's okay in that area. I think I'm confusing him with uh, Miller. Yeah, he's not okay in that. You don't. But think you're, so? you're, you are confusing. It could with be Miller. worse. Yeah. It could be worse. Um. Papadopoulos, also a smack in the face. Oh, <laughs> yeah, with a biscuit. I, <laughs> boot to the head. Yeah. <laughs> I want to just crack a cracker over his head, kind of. <laughs> They're biscuit crackers. That's not racist. Oh. <laughs> I didn't even pick up what you were okay, putting down good, there. Good. <laughs> I was like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> um, what would I get him? Uh, probably some clear sill. Um, Manafort. <laughs> Oh, another, uh, oh, a fake ostrich jacket, a knockoff. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Nice, for prison? Like a, maybe a, a, a black and white stripes where the black stripes are ostrich? Yeah, or homemade, mm-hmm. like an actual, oh, I guess that is the point, but like less <laughs> elegant, like just like skin and ostrich. No, that's awful. That's a mean thing to do to the ostrich, <laughs> but be really funny for me. Oh, ostrich. Yeah, mm-hmm. there we go, yeah. An ostrich suit. I'd say um, a bottle of wine, just double down on the gout. <laughs> He'd be smart on taking any beverages with There's polonium some red tea meat out there. And some wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get that gout. Get it. Uh, Don Jr. Oh. Mm. A dad. I was going to say, like, <laughs> something family related. Poor, poor chap. My buddy. I'd get him my buddy. Yeah. <laughs> my buddy and me. Oh, one of those little Trump bears. Trumpy bear. Oh, a Trumpy bear. Yeah. Oh, don't get my. It's a better one. father figure. <laughs> uh, Ivanka. A clue. <laughs> hmm. Good taste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would uh, give. Ooh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, something about like giving her the responsibility that she keeps trying to avoid, but I couldn't figure it out. Yours is probably better. No. Well, I was thinking like um, like a a saw because Kushner is Pinocchio to me, and oh. I think she needs to saw off his nose. <laughs> That's a stretch. That is still I better went to than Disneyland, mine and I could only think about Kushner <laughs> being Pinocchio. I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna say like, give, like give him a saw, like a file and a cake. Oh, <laughs> uh, Kushner. What would you get, Kushner? Oh man, um, puberty. Mm, that'd be nice. <laughs> Blush. <laughs> his balls to drop. It's getting really abstract. <laughs> Hannity. What would you get for Hannity? Oh my goodness. I hate that guy. It's hard to even play along with him. <laughs> give him uh, an alias so he can continue to tweet. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I give him a bucket to wear as a hat because his face is in the shape of a square. Oh. Bucket head. Yeah. <laughs> a time machine to undo all of his collusion. What would you get, Matthew fucking Whitaker? I think I'd get him a, a masculine toilet. A name tag. <laughs> Hello. My name is Matthew fucking Whitaker. Earmuffs. Oh. <laughs> Hear no evil, see no evil. Just because it looks great on his dildo head, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, if you want to keep the position, good. you're probably going to need to start not hearing things. Mm-hmm. Uh, at Eric Robson wants to know where St- uh, Stephen Miller will land after all this. Uh, I think he's going to take Cy Sperling's job. I'm Cy Sperling, president of Hair Club for Men. And remember, I'm not only the hair club president, but I'm also a client. At Michael Poima asked if Flynn is lying because he was following orders, like Ollie North um, and his allegiance to Reagan. I probably. Um, Whose orders would that be then? Right. Is it <laughs> directly from Putin? Is, is it Trump? Is it oh. is it Pence? Is it Putin? Is Pence. It? Oh, I'm hoping Pence. Yeah. Got to get him for something. But yeah. Those GSA emails, we've got them because over my dead body. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's Beckler. Um, at Vintage underscore Bridge asked if that unknown country owned company could have anything to do with Azerbaijan because the prosecutor is a Middle East specialist, which is why she doesn't think it's China, Russia or Germany. 
Mm. Okay. But I think that um, the Middle East specialist, Ahmed, uh, was there because she worked on the Flynn case. Yeah. I was mm-hmm. wondering if that was a connection. Yeah. But, I, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I'm, we're all guessing. This yeah. is all just conjecture. We, <laughs> it's probably something completely that we didn't even like. It's Jordan or something. Mm-hmm. Not oh. you, but the country. Right, right. No, um, it's me. I should have picked a rando <laughs> country for the fi- it's campaign. Me. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. It's me. Want to buy a rock? <laughs> yeah, country A. <laughs> <laughs> um, at Thockman64 says, Seth Abramson made a good case about why Mueller isn't close to being done when NBC and others keep reporting he's near done based on an anonymous source. Who's right? Uh, so NBC put out a story this week that Mueller is going to turn in a report mid-February, and I didn't report on this, and I didn't do that for a reason, because I don't think it's correct. Oh. Um, it mentions that he's going to give his report to the AG. We don't have an AG right now. <laughs> so, like, how are you, what are you talking about? Um, and it, and it, it doesn't even say, like, is it the obstruction piece? Is it the collusion piece? What report are you talking about? Are you talking about a grand jury uh, document sent over to the House um, – Judiciary Committee, like the Jaworski report was, like what report are you talking about? It just it didn't seem to add up to me that he would be done in February, especially considering all these new things. Revelations. Are, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of layers to this. So maybe the beginning of the report, you know, dropping some because he can do that, right? Mueller can say, oh, he can't do like updates like along the way. If there are emergencies. Yeah. But yeah. I don't think he's going to do that. In this case. Yeah, no, it doesn't yeah, make any sense. Gonna, yeah. Because mm-hmm. you could reveal shit that's part of an open and ongoing investigation right, right? So not his style no yeah. yeah not at all very bad for very bad <laughs> investigations um so yeah i'm <clears throat> i'm with seth on that actually i don't think that that's oh uh, i mean it's feasible but not likely yeah it's you know i'm I'm over here like conjecting super space beans but i'm like no i'm not gonna read your thing about reports due in february that's yeah. just crazy well the funny thing is <laughs> the news moves so quickly that two months from now feels like a lifetime sometimes so i guess we'll see yeah um at kmcd 715 asked how fucked are we All right, guys, so that clip was given to us by um, a friend at the Voices of Our City Choir. They are uh, an organization, a nonprofit, that is a choir made up of homeless people in San Diego. And I think that that's amazing. And so pretty soon, somehow, somewhere, some way, we're going to sell that um, sound clip as a ringtone. And all the proceeds are going to go to... Voices of Our City Choir. Yeah. So thanks to them for helping us put that together. That's an amazing clip. <laughs> I know, right? Um, let's see. At uh, Sharoni Baloney says, African or European? Um, a I don't, preference I don't, of race or what are we I talking? I don't know. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a holy grail joke. Oh. <laughs> I, I think. I I'm hope. really glad I didn't answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> it went right over my head there. <laughs> Bees? <laughs> <laughs> remember the africanized bees oh, yeah. so scary yeah, yeah. Ooh, the africanized bees are coming they're not like our nice european bees <laughs> wasps we call them <laughs> shithole bees, <laughs> shithole bees. <laughs> at least they have bees, bees. <laughs> <laughs> poor pedro um <clears throat> yeah no african or european i'm assuming uh sharoni baloney is talking about the holy grail quote where he's like what is your name what is your or no the coconuts the coconuts right he's oh, like where'd you oh, get the coconuts yeah. oh the you know maybe they were carried here uh coconuts don't migrate and he's like well maybe it was a bird and he's like african or european swallow i don't know <laughs> oh, and then he okay okay yeah what's the average airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow African or European. That's, <laughs> <clears throat> I hope that's what she's talking about. <laughs> or bees. Um, at uh, Alexa G. Winton asked, uh, will we survive? That's pretty deep. Yeah. Uh, here's a quote from Dan Rather. If you've only been listening to cable news tonight or reading your news alerts on social media, you might have the impression, given this tumultuous news day, that the country is coming apart at the seams. But please pause and take a deep breath. The government, especially the Trump presidency, is in chaos and dysfunction, but the country is not. This is not to minimize the grave danger of the moment, but we must also realize that we are an expansive, diverse, and resilient country of active and impassioned citizens and deep resources, material and otherwise. We are people of great resolve who possess the ability to adjust and survive. We have proven that time and again. So, steady. Please, steady. There is plenty to worry about, plenty to resolve, uh, plenty to not normalize. 
plenty of fight for our rights and justice. But I have seen many dark days before, and I believe we'll make our way through the current crisis eventually to not just survive, but to thrive. The arc of history is long, complicated, and beyond any of our ability to fully comprehend. But life has taught me things are seldom as bad or good as they appear at any given moment of time. Have courage. That's what Dan Rather says. Beautiful. (sighs) I know I like that one. Guys, that's our show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Merry Christmas. Yeah, I said it. That was fun. It was loose. I fucking love Christmas. Edgy. Oh, yeah. Happy holidays. I guess I'll be that (laughs) person. (laughs) Edgelord. Uh, but I'm not afraid to say happy holidays, merry solstice, happy Yule, happy Festivus, happy Kwanzaa, happy Hanukkah, yeah. whatever you celebrate. I don't care. Say it all. Be safe. Enjoy mm-hmm. your time with your family or your chosen family or your friends. Uh, it's been a heck of a year. And I think 2019 is going to be epic. Um, but we'll be heading out on the road soon. Mm-hmm. So follow us on Twitter at Muller, she wrote to stay in the know on that to see where we're going to pop up. Uh, if you enjoyed this ad-free episode and you want them all the time, please become a patron. Um, we're real close to putting out a second episode. Uh, we're going to do that for patrons mm-hmm. um, every week. So head to patreon.com slash Muller, she wrote, uh, and uh, g- give today. Support Women in Podcast. It's three bucks. You get uh, – there. Yeah. I think there's like over – 40 or 50 bonus episodes now including yeah. all the book club stuff it's good stuff on there mm-hmm. you get to unlock all of that that's like a zillion hours of stuff for three dollars yeah it's, three bucks is less than a coffee it's yeah. crazy unless you go to mcdonald's don't go to mcdonald's and you get your fancy newsletter that mm-hmm. jordan puts out mm-hmm. uh, every week which is awesome mm-hmm. anyway yeah become a patron um you can play the fantasy indictment league it's fun we all have a good time in our closed facebook group what are we up to there a couple of thousand yeah there. at least yeah probably like Closer to 2,500 now? Yeah. Wow, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's a really cool community. Um, we're very supportive, and uh, we'd love you to join it. So patreon.com slash Muller, she wrote. We've got one final episode left in 2018, so we will see you next week. I've been AG. I've been Chalisa Johnson. I've been Jordan Coburn. And this is Muller, she wrote. Muller She Wrote is produced and engineered by AG with editing and logo design by Jaleesa Johnson. Our marketing consultant and social media manager is Sarah Lee Steiner, and our subscriber and communications director is Jordan Coburn. Fact checking and research by AG, and research assistance by Jaleesa Johnson and Jordan Coburn. Our merchandising managers are Sarah Lee Steiner and Sarah Hirschberger Valencia. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios, and our website is MullerSheWrote.com. 